And when it comes to women in power throughout history, were any of them truly in the wrong, or were the history books just very judgy and biased? Look, my opinion tends to fall towards the latter, so let me know your take in the comments, and let's explore some great historical figures. We're kicking off today with Rani of Jhansi. She was the Maharani consort of the princely state of Jhansi in Maratha Empire from 1843 till 1853, by marriage to the Maharaja Gangadhar Rao Nuwakar. I tried folks. When the Maharaja died in 1853, the British East India Company under Governor General Lord Dalhousie refused to recognize the claim of his adopted heir and annexed Jhansi under the doctrine of lapse. The Indian warrior queen is known for joining the revolution against British oppression in 1857, shortly after they deposed the queen. She led the successful defense of Jhansi against company allies, but in early 1858 Jhansi fell to British forces under the command of Hugh Rose. The Rainey managed to escape on horseback and joined the rebels in capturing Gwalior, where they proclaimed Nana Sahib as Peshwa of the revived Maratha Empire. Rani was trained as a horseback rider and sword wielder from a young age and was quick to join the fight for India's freedom. Several slayings of British civilians occurred during this period, and whether or not Rani was involved is disputed. The British certainly believe she oversaw the slayings, and she ultimately perished fighting against them. She died in June of 1858 after being mortally wounded during the British counterattack at Gwalior, and is viewed today as a hero in India against tyranny. So I don't know if she was necessarily evil evil, but a woman in power I like. Here's another lesser known ruler, Nzinga of Nundongo and Matamba. She was a southwest African ruler who ruled as queen of the Umbudu kingdoms. She received military and political training when she was young and demonstrated an aptitude for diffusing political crises as an ambassador to the Portuguese empire. In 1624 she assumed power over Ndongo after the death of her brother Mbandi and she ruled during a period of rapid growth of the African slave trade and encroachment by the Portuguese empire in southwest Africa. Now the Portuguese declared war on Ndongo in 1626 and by 1628 the army had been severely depleted and went into exile. In search of ally, she married Mbangala warlord Kazanje. In addition to using Christianity as a diplomatic tool, she adopted Christian customs into her court. So from the 1650s onwards, she increasingly relied on Christian converts at said court. Just as she had done with the Mbangalan culture before, she appropriated aspects of Christian ideology and culture, adding these to her existing court traditions to create a new class of Christian counselors loyal to her. She also began practicing Catholic inspired rituals, placed crosses in places of high honor in her court, and built many churches across her kingdom. Now, her efforts to convert her people were not without controversy, and some conservative religious figures kind of pushed back against her policies. In response, she empowered her Christian priests to burn the temples and shrines of practitioners who opposed her, in order that they be arrested and turned over to her for trial. Traditionalists were dismissed from her court, after which she sentenced them to public whippings. Several prominent Mbundo and Imbangala priests were sold as slaves to the Portuguese, with Nzinga personally asking that they be shipped overseas. Profits of the sale were then used to furnish a new church. Some of the wanted priests, however, escaped the purge and went into hiding. Look, I was all for her until she forced people to convert to Christianity and then banished them when they didn't. That's where I draw the line. Here's another lady ruler, the Byzantine Empress Irene of Athens, who ruled between 797 to 802 CE. She co-ruled with her son for two decades before leading the kingdom by herself. Atta girl! Her son, Emperor Constantine VI, was an unpopular emperor. The mother-son duo was indeed a Greek tragedy. She was an ambitious woman, but she wanted full control of the empire. Like, I don't blame her for that part. Here's how she did it though. With the help of some political allies, she led a conspiracy against her own son. Eventually, they did reconcile, but I'm not done yet. In 786, the public turned against Constantine after he decided to divorce his wife and marry his mistress, and Irene took advantage of that and once again conspired against her son. She ordered his arrest and gouged his eyes out. Like, look, it's a little extreme. Most if not all historians agree that she only blinded him for her own personal selfish political gain, since he wasn't really that bad of an emperor and wasn't doing anything to make any situations worse, so her killing him was kind of pointless. Pun not intended. Her lack of an heir and continued loss of legitimacy is what doomed her. Like, if she had just kidnapped her son and shipped him off somewhere, then historians would probably like her more. Maybe. I'm not so sure how I feel about her. Queen Rana Valona, the first of Madagascar, slayed her way to the crown, and sadly, not in a like modern like slay, more like a bad slay. Queen Rana Valona was the ruler of Madagascar from 1828 to 1861, and much of what we know about her has been influenced by the opinions of 
Rana Valona's European contemporaries. They generally condemned her policies and characterized her as a tyrant at best and insane at worst. Still, she was known as a fierce leader who was willing to do anything to protect her crown and kingdom. After her husband, King Radama I, passed, she quickly positioned herself as the new sovereign of the kingdom. She had her uncle executed to protect her position, and some accounts say that she eliminated his mother via extreme hunger in order to keep her from breaking a sacred degree about spilling noblewoman's uh, life source. Now, she pursued a policy of isolationism and self sufficiency, reducing economic and political ties with European powers, repelling a French attack on the coastal town of Full Point, and taking vigorous measures to eradicate the small but growing Malagasy Christian movement initiated under Radama I by members of the London Missionary Society. She made heavy use of the traditional practice of forced labor as tax payment to complete public works projects and develop a standing army of between 20 to 30,000 marina soldiers, whom she deployed to pacify outlying regions of the island and further expand the realm. The combination of regular warfare, disease, difficult forced labor, and harsh trials by ordeal, using a poisonous nut from the Tangena shrub, resulted in a high mortality rate among both soldiers and civilians during her 33 year reign. With Madagascar's population reducing from 5 million in 1833 to 2.5 in 1839. Like, I get being ambitious, I get wanting to protect your country, but that's a really bad dip in population. Princess Olga of Kiev burned her political enemies alive while she was queen regent. So there's a lot of mystery surrounding her, and there's a lot of the stories tend to have some holes in them. But what we do know is that she was a Ukrainian princess and the first female ruler in Russian history. She became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband, Igor I, was slain. And since her son was a little too young to rule, they're like, okay, you're queen. One of her first acts was to seek revenge for her husband's demise. Mice. So by her orders, the men responsible were captured and executed using scalding water. And she didn't stop there, or else she wouldn't be too memorable. In her fury, she ordered the hundreds of people from the men's tribe to be taken out in retribution for her husband. Some accounts suggest that Olga had the tribe leaders be buried alive, and that she devised a plan to set their entire town on fire. One story suggests that she fooled the tribe leaders by inviting them to a retreat, then locked them in a bathhouse and burned it down. Whatever really happens, and it's not fun, Olga devoted herself to Orthodox Christianity shortly after her vengeance was complete. Despite her past, she eventually became the first person of Russian heritage to receive sainthood from the Orthodox Church. Okay, I get wanting revenge, I do, but there's a line. <laughs> How about we chat about another notable Russian ruler next? When Catherine the Great first arrived in Russia, no one knew that this relatively unimportant German princess will one day rule all of Russia. She was eventually married to Tsar Paul III, who was an unpopular leader. He had run afoul of the Orthodox Church, and even his own wife wrote in memoirs that he was a feeble-minded drunkard. Oof, not good. Catherine took on a lover, Grigory Orlov, and together they were able to court the country's military leadership and overthrow the husband. She was a talented horseback rider and personally led 14,000 soldiers to depose the Tsar. Afterwards, she donned a male uniform and declared herself the Empress of Russia. Also, she apparently was like a bit of a Luddite. She did not understand the true power of the Industrial Revolution, and she was against introducing machines into Russia, you know, emerging industries. Primarily iron smelting, fabric production, those things that like really could make some money. She thought the machines destroyed jobs, and like, I get it, but oh boy. So this led to a predictable crisis at the end of the 18th century when Russian industries fell way behind their Western competition. Once again, I get it, it's just not a good move. Time to leave Russia and talk about Zenobia, the 3rd century queen of the Palmyrian Empire in Syria. Many legends surround her ancestry. She was probably not a commoner, and she married the ruler of the city, Odeonethus. Her husband became king in 260, elevating our girl to supreme power in the Near East by defeating the Sasanian Empire of Persia and stabilizing the Roman East. Now, After her husband's assassination, Zenobia became regent of her son Vabalathus and held de facto power throughout his reign. In 270, Zenobia launched an invasion that brought most of the Roman East under her sway and culminated with the annexation of Egypt. By mid-271, her realm extended from Assyria, Central Anatolia, to Upper Egypt, although she remained nominally subordinate to Rome. However, in reaction to the campaign of the Roman Emperor Aurelian in 272, Zenobia declared her son Emperor and assumed the title of Empress, thus declaring the succession from Rome. The Romans were victorious after heavy fighting, the Empress was besieged in her capital and captured by Aurelian, who exiled her to Rome, and that's where she spent the rest of her time. Fredegund of Soissons was queen consort to King Chilperic I, who ruled from 561 to 584 CE. 
Now she came from humble beginnings, but quickly rose to a position of power in the small Frankish kingdom. She convinced her husband to leave his first wife and slay his second, ensuring her close relationship with the king was secure. So after all that happened, enter Brunhild. She was the wife of Siegbert I, the king of Austrasia, who was half-brother to Chilperic. This caused a fierce rivalry between the two queens, because she was like, yo, why are you making your husband leave all these people? And um, they had a lot of death. It wasn't fun. Okay, here's a name everybody should know, Catherine de' Medici. It was no new news that Henry II of France had a lifelong affair with his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. Well, on his deathbed, he begged his wife, Queen Catherine, to allow him to see her. And the queen was like, yeah, no, Diane's not even coming anywhere near this room. The king died a lonely and painful death without his love by his side. But okay, that's not what made her a terrible queen. The queen mother had a rebellious daughter named Margaret, who decided to cross the queen, and Catherine was like, I'm gonna get my revenge. She would fight over her married daughter's adultery and affairs. It is said that Catherine's screams could be heard echoing throughout the palace. During one instance, when the queen mother found out about her daughter's new romantic interest, well, she locked her up in the castle and we never saw her ever again. Now look, I do understand that these emotions might have stemmed from the fact that, well, Catherine's husband had a mistress. But she proved herself as one of the worst queens in history when she ordered that her daughter's romantic interest be executed in front of her. So her son, King Henry, was like, okay, that's a bit too much. He had the guy executed, but like not in front of his sister. Alrighty folks, we're ending today with Isabella of France. She had a complicated relationship with her husband, King Edward II of England. The relationship would end over their opposing politics and a breakdown of trust in each other. Edward was known to keep male favorites close to him, often as advisors. Hugh de Spencer the Younger became his chamberlain in 1318 and immediately began to push Isabella out of the king's sphere of influence. Edward began to favor de Spencer over Isabella to the point where it was like, eh, go do something else. Eventually, Edward faced conflict with King Charles of France, Isabella's brother. Isabella's lands were confiscated and she left for France. After Edward refused to return her land and get rid of de Spencer, she and her brother invaded England and deposed the king. Now their son, Edward III, was then named as ruler of England. Uh, you know what, after everything else today, killing your husband? Yeah, it doesn't seem so bad anymore. At number 10, royal enemas. Apparently, back in the day, enemas were all the rage amongst the elite. It was believed that enemas were good for your health, so everyone was doing it to try and live a little longer than the rest of those commoners and peasants. One person who really just couldn't get enough enemas in his life was King Louis XIV. It is believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. When I tell you this guy was obsessed, I'm not kidding. One year, Louis received 212 enemas in just the one year. And of course, he had to make his enemas a little jazzy and couldn't just use water like any other person. Oh no, my guy was using things like almond milk. His enemas were also sometimes scented with orange or rose and sometimes even colored just to make it a little more special. To get an idea of just how obsessed the elite were with receiving enemas, just think about the fact that a French duchess once received one during a court ball. The duchess was in the middle of having a conversation with Louis XIV and during this conversation, Conversation, one of her maids came over, snuck under her dress, and gave the duchess an enema on the spot. Ew. These people were so weird. At number 9, Pampered Pony. I'm sure I can speak for most people when I say when you have a pet, you love and care for that thing like it is your child, right? Well, one Roman emperor might have taken that concept a little bit too far because saying that he was obsessed with his horse is an understatement. The Roman emperor known as Caligula had a horse named Incitatus. Caligula was a horse racing enthusiast, so Incitatus was his pride and joy, and not too many people were all that thrilled about it, to be honest. When I tell you this horse was treated better than most people have ever been, I'm not kidding. The horse's stall was made out of marble, his manger was made out of ivory, and he was even fed oats flaked with gold. Caligula was also very adamant about his horse receiving a good and restful sleep before a race, and he was so serious about it that he made guards stand outside of the horse's stable to make sure that the horse remained undisturbed while it slept. This horse even had its own furniture. Like what is he gonna do with it? He's a horse. Caligula was so fond of his horse that he even made it a priest and promised to make him consul, which was the lead position in the Roman government after the emperor, highly coveted by senators. This was the last straw for people because the emperor was putting his horse above his own people, 
so he was assassinated. Now before I carry on telling you guys about the wild and crazy things that kings did back in the day, I would like to first ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also maybe think about subscribing as well to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Mumia Medicine. It's safe to say that medicine from the past is very different from modern times. These days we have pharmaceuticals to treat illnesses, but back in the days of old there were very different and quite questionable methods of treating ailments, and one of those methods included cannibalism. In the 16th and 17th centuries, it was common practice for elites like priests, kings, and other nobles to consume remedies that included human bones, blood, and fat as medicine to treat ailments from headaches to epilepsy. And this practice was called mummia medicine. At first, it started with people using Egyptian mummies and skulls from Irish graves for use in medicine, as bones would be ground and used in different tinctures for various uses. But soon, other parts of the body started to be used. Human and fat was later used to treat ailments on the outside of the body, and blood would be consumed as well as it was believed to contain the vitality of life. Several monarchs were known to use mummia medicine, like Charles II and William II of England, Francois I of France, and Christian IV of Denmark. At number 7, Kissing Sheets For thousands of years, monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies, and so they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed in the morning. They would kiss the pillows, sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning clothing too, so his clothes as well as his son's clothes were also tested for poison before getting dressed. At number 6, Eternal Youth I know that there are a lot of people out there who want to live forever. I am one of those people. I am afraid of dying, but I also want to see what humanity will look like many many years from now until the sun consumes the earth. Unfortunately, that's kind of impossible, at least for now, until we come up with some kind of way to make people live longer. But this idea of prolonging your life has been around for thousands of years, and one Chinese emperor was super obsessed with the idea, and really tried his best to live for at least another 10,000 years. Emperor Ying Zhang was obsessed with finding a magic elixir that would make him live longer, and he demanded that his subjects find this immortality elixir for him. Now, even though he brought a lot of prosperity to people during his rule, he never let go of his demand for immortality, and it put a lot of pressure on his underlings to find him something to help him live forever, but obviously that didn't happen. He was so concerned with his lifespan that he even brought magicians into his court. His obsession alienated him from his people, and after after all of that effort trying to live longer, he died at the age of 49. At number 5, no bathing. These days, bathing is kind of a necessary thing. You gotta be clean, you have to smell nice, you have to practice proper hygiene. But back in the olden days, this was the complete opposite and nobles rarely ever bathed and it was kind of a trend. Over time, physicians began to believe that bathing was dangerous and obviously the nobility tried to protect their lives and well-being at all costs and so they just stopped bathing. In a popular 16th century medical book, it was advised, quote, Use not baths or stews nor sweat too much. For all openeth pores of a man's body, maketh the venomous air to open, and for to infect the blood." End quote. So yeah, they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. In the late 15th century, Queen Isabella of Spain would go around bragging about the fact that she had only ever bathed twice in her whole life. Weird flex, but okay. King James IV apparently never bathed, and his hygiene was so bad that he passed on lice to other people who went into a room that was frequented by the king. He also never washed his hands before eating and would just rub his fingers with the wet end of a napkin. These people were gross. At number 4, Prankster King You know that you're a spoiled king when you can pull pranks on people constantly and never have anyone try and stop you or fight back. This was basically the life of King Christian VII of Denmark, who was known for being pretty childish and playing pranks on people his whole life. He was a troublemaker through and through. He was known to play pranks on his grandmother by putting pins in her throne and he would throw things at her and he even ran through the streets with his friend and his mistress, destroying shops and patrons brothels. He even made his own torture rack, had himself tied to it, and flogged. Why? 
I have an idea, but I don't want to think about that one too hard. One of the other weird things that he was known to do was leapfrog over dignitaries when they would bow to him. This guy was really quite immature. At number three, saints in bed. I understand the desire to feel protected by whatever gods or saints you might believe in. That's one of the whole points of religion. However, I think some people can take that idea a little bit too far, and by some people, I mean the Spanish royal family. These guys took religion very, very seriously, and they believed that following religion heavily would allow God to heal them when they were sick. So, when a member of the royal family was ill, doctors would remove body parts or even entire corpses of saints from churches and monasteries and would put them in bed with the person who was ill. Yeah, they slept with the corpses of dead saints to be healed of their sickness. Could you imagine if that was still how medicine was practiced today? At number two, rat court martial. There has been a record of many kings throughout history who were complete children through and through. Even though many of them grew into adulthood, they still acted immature, and one of the greatest examples of that was Peter III of Russia. He was not a good ruler or a good husband to his wife, who would later become Catherine the Great. Peter spent every night in bed with her playing toy soldiers because he was obsessed with his little dolls. He was so obsessed, in fact, that when a rat chewed the head off one of his toy soldiers, he was so upset that he held a proper military court martial for the rat. He proclaimed the rat guilty of treason and had it hung in a tiny gallows that he had built for the occasion. It was weird, but in the end that bizarre event helped Catherine overthrow her husband, so I guess it kind of worked out for someone. And finally, at number one, groom of the stool. Guys, I found the worst job in history. You think working at the one star Domino's pizza in your neighborhood is bad? Wait until you find out about the groom of the stool. The groom of the stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry around a commode at all times, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his is uh break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have had to quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. Sounds like a pretty crappy job to me. But I'm I'm not funny, I'll leave. Tradition number 10 is no jail time. Many queens enjoy what's called sovereign immunity, which essentially means they cannot commit a legal wrong and are immune from civil or criminal proceedings. Let's say for example, the late Queen Elizabeth iron knuckles a guy in the mouth, Deadpool style, because her tea was too chilly. And it causes a visceral spray of blood and a need for orbital surgery. And let's say she committed this armed attack in front of her entire family on Christmas. What happens to the Queen? Prosecutors could go after the Crown as executive, but then the Queen's ministers would act on her behalf and accept any punishment that was doled out for her. While this immunity extends to other British heads of state during their time in office, the Queen is protected for life since that's how long she holds her position. And she did. So what other monarchy other than the British has this criminal immunity? Belgium's constitution states the King is voyable and his ministers are accountable accountable too, as does Denmark's. And since 1848, the Dutch constitution states the king is immune from prosecution, the ministers are responsible. The constitution of Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and Sweden all have sovereign immunity, but without holding the ministers accountable. If a crime is committed, everyone just walks away scot-free. In places like Iceland, meanwhile, their queen can only be prosecuted with consent of parliament, and in India, no legal action can be taken against their leader as long is their holding office, but you can get them impeached then sue, so that's something. Tradition number nine is animal hoarding. I've always hated hearing people discuss how the British queen or king, whoever is on the throne, just owns all the fishes royales, so animals like whales, dolphins, sturgeons, porpoises, and even swans, thanks to a year 1300 rule. These guys are out here completely splashing around free and clear and completely unaware that they're owned by any petty human laws. However, owning a horde of pets is quite different, and Elizabeth and her corgis are nowhere near the first ruling monarch to start that tradition or build laws to protect them. Hippos were royal family animals back in ancient times 
of Egypt and were protected by law for centuries. Dogs, however, seem to have struck the hearts of European nobility. Mary Queen of Scots spent her life with dogs and loved them so much that she had hers legally licensed and protected, keeping them with her through her exile and imprisonment, and even her most adored lap dog was found in her petticoat just minutes after her head was chopped off. Charles II of England loved spaniels just like how Elizabeth loves corgis. In 1685, the writer John Evelyn wrote in his diary that Charles loved having a number of little spaniels follow him and lie in the bedchamber. And when the old king died there, it was surrounded by the beloved dogs. Versailles, home to the Bourbon King of France from 1682 to 1789, was filthy and attracted rats. So what did they have? Cats. Too many cats. One day, Louis XVI went to his commode, unaware that one of his Angora cats had curled up in the porcelain bowl below. And to quote, when events galvanized the cat into attacking the sovereign from below, a dazed Louis fled, stockings in hand, ringing all the bell pulls. And who could forget Josephine, the wife of Napoleon, who literally started her own private zoo. Tradition number eight is royal baby easel. This one is locked into just British monarchy, and it's more weird than messed up. The first person to learn of a new young royal's arrival to the world must be the queen. Hands down, no debate, even if a king is in the picture. But when it's time to share the news with the world, well, out comes the ceremonial golden easel and the poster board, set up smack dab outside Buckingham Palace. When Prince Louis was born in April of 2018, it was put on the same easel that announced his father, Prince William's arrival in 1982. Historically, the notices are handwritten, but today they're typed out with the time and birth just penned in. Tradition number seven is continuing patronage. Being a queen comes with a Bible, even if you aren't religious by any means or Christian. This was just set in stone as a tradition by the olden time of ergot riddled bread and corporal punishment for showing your ankles. So naturally, we still have it in place today because they knew best back then. Alrighty, anyways, the act of patronage and specifically religious patronage was very important during the Middle Ages. It became an active area of queenship studies because it was pretty much one of the only ways that queens could exert great influence. While religious patronage included the founding of religious institutions that could signal political alliances at the same time. Margaret of France, Isabella of France, and Philippa of Hainault, for example, were all patrons of Greyfriars Church in London, but that patronage was also connected to their mutual Capetian ties, the dynasty of France. With religion often shared between countries, even at times of war, it could be used manipulatively to bring bridges of truce. Being on good terms with the church could always be beneficial to medieval queens in other ways too. For example, when John of England refused to pay Benegadia of Navarre the pension she was owed as the Queen Doega and widow of Richard I, Pope Innocent III intervened on her behalf and told him to cough it up in a humble and religious way. This also earned queens consolidations as saints even sometimes after their passing. Tradition number six is following blueprint. Remember Meghan? having the Christmas dinner at the Windsor family with her mother and the whole awkward addressing of the getting laid before and after eating thing. If Meghan was to follow the blueprint, she would have never stated anything about it. Rather, thank the queen for the meal and the proof that her belly is full. Now obviously, it's a pretty effed tradition and good on Meghan for not taking that crap, but following the blueprint has been so driven into monarchy, especially female monarchy, that even the public was upset with her. To follow the blueprint is to mimic the royal woman above you, especially should you be in the presence or potentially one day taking their role. Who created the blueprint of what a medieval queen should be and how she should behave? Not any one person. Ancient Egypt felt a queen should be a certain way. Ancient Rome that a queen should stay silent. Ancient Mesoamerica, a queen was equivalent to a king and did whatever he did. It varies per culture and thus every monarchy system created its own blueprint. Within this, there was literature specifically aimed at princesses and queens within their applicable regions. For instance, Joan I of Navarre's confessor, Durand de Champagne, wrote a text named Mirror for Ladies, which advised Joan on how to be a good queen to her husband, Philip of France, in the bedroom. In China, biographies of ancient queens provided examples of rulers whose behavior was to be modeled, as well as those deemed to be a bad influence, aka your do's and don'ts book. Italian-French author Christine de Pizan's book, The Treasure of the City of Ladies, dedicated to Margaret of Burgundy, also aimed to instruct women
women of all classes on how to present themselves. Tradition number five is dress code. Inevitably within the blueprint will be the dress and guidelines. While they have become lax in recent years for most kingdoms and women are able to have more control on their garb and no longer have to wear 30 unnecessary layers, they still have certain restrictions. For example, there's the endless tabloid attention paid to the Spanish royals for their level of chic. Queen Letizia has openly broken dress code several times. In 2015, when delivering the flag to the 11th National Teach Zone of the Civil Guard, she broke the mandatory dress code of wearing all black and a Spanish mantilla in favor of a short and incredibly stylish white ensemble. It also violated tradition by being an outfit repeat. She wore the same white getup to her husband's proclamation as king. I can't talk about dress code violation without mentioning our baby girl Princess Diana, who had the stuffy Brits flying out of their knee-high tube socks over her sweaters and bike shorts. Meghan was also highly criticized in recent years for challenging dress code, which is prudish and bland at best in England. You aren't allowed bright nail polish and the now deceased queen forbid ladies from trousers at social events, and you had to own those big stupid hats. Tradition number four is pretty pressure. Essentially, queens were expected to be the ultimate good woman, a model of virtuous behavior. They were expected to be good wives and mothers as well as good rulers, but they were also meant to be pious peacemakers and to look pretty, but not so pretty you don't want to respect them, but also still pretty enough you want to pay attention. Think about that Barbie monologue. That naturally comes with the endless critique. Beauty was obviously a huge part of a queen's role, and they were expected to represent contemporary ideals. William Caxton, in his 15th century book, the game and play of chess states that the queen ought to be a fair lady sitting in their chair and crowned with a corona on her head and clad with cloth of gold. She should also, he writes, take care to be chaste, wise, of honest life, and well-mannered. It's interesting that beauty is the very first quality that Caxton names in his text, and we can see this in other sources of medieval eras, such as the Welsh Triads, or the 13th century Las Diet Patridias, Kingdom Law Book, where it's written that the qualities that kings should look for in a bride is the more beautiful the queen is, the more the king will love her, and the more handsome their children will be. No mention of being a good political leader. So it's really interesting again seeing how these ideals of queenship tied together. Alfonso was basically equating the idea that a beautiful woman will make a good wife and a good mother, which takes us back full circle to those expectations of medieval queens to be everything. Tradition number three is tax exemption. This one sucks. Imagine you happen to be born in random luck of the draw blood line and just don't have to pay taxes. Quite a few countries had laws in regards to their leaders, be it king or queen, being exempt from tax. Queen Elizabeth wasn't required and now neither is Charles, however, Elizabeth had been voluntarily paying income and capital gain taxes since 1992. Her grandsons are also paying their taxes, but do not have to. King Juan Carlos, Spain's former monarch, has paid about $820,000 in back taxes amid an investigation by prosecutors into whether he and other royal members of the royal family used bank accounts in other people's names to hide assets from tax authorities. The payment announcement came just a month after the Spanish media revealed an investigation into possible tax Invasion, and that occurred after Juan abdicated in 2014 and was no longer shielded by immunity from prosecution. The extent of that immunity has become an issue in previous corruption cases, but it remains an unsettled question. The Belgian royal family no longer holds any power, but receives large payments for their advisements and roles as, not to be rude, figureheads. These payments are always taxed, as are the family. Dutch royals are among the monarchies exempt from paying income tax still. Last year, the Prime Minister Mark Rutte rejected opposition demands to scrap the exemption. His government proposed an annual royal budget of 50.2 million pounds for 2023 untaxed. Tradition number two is no ID needed. Royal prerogative is a special exemption statute from certain statute laws. England is famous for allowing its queen or king the right to no driver's license, no upholding of speed limits, and traveling without needing of a passport. That means even though Queen Elizabeth preferred to stick to driving on her private estates, she could technically go speeding around London and running red lights if she wanted to. Japan's Emperor Narhito and Empress Masako are also exempt. 
as stated in a ministry document dated for May 10th of 1971. Apparently, it would be highly inappropriate to issue a passport to the emperor or empress. The document also stated that it will be highly inappropriate for the emperor to undergo immigration or visa procedures using a passport as an ordinary citizen. The Dutch head of state, similar to Elizabeth, does not require a passport for the reason that all passports in his country are technically issued by him. So it would be funny for the king to have a passport where he himself has to ask for permission to allow himself into another country. Tradition number one is two birthdays. The two birthday tradition for British monarch dates back to 1748 when King George II combined the annual summer military march with his birthday celebration, which should have been during the winter. As to quote, with a November birthday being too cold for celebratory parades, he tied his celebration in with the annual Trooping of the Color military parade. Trooping the Color, a military parade, has its origins on the battlefield. A regime flag or colors was a key rallying point for soldiers during battle, so obviously you gotta recognize your own flag. To ensure soldiers would recognize it, the flag was marched around, aka trooped, for the ranks to see. A regiment's colors came to have huge significance for serving soldiers, and the gain or loss of colors were seen as decisive moments in battle. Nowadays, since it also doubles as a birthday party where the kid invited his whole class, the marching of troops is a spectacular and boring display of 1,400 parading soldiers, 400 horses, and 400 musicians. The monarch arrives at the beginning, looks over the troop, the band performs, the bagpipe guys proceed to make an obtrusive wall of noise, and then they all start marching. The royal carriage follows along. Starting with how Queen Victoria was anti-women's rights. Ah, isn't that fun? Queen Victoria, who ruled England from 1837 until 19. 1901 was in the perfect position to be the forerunner for the women's movement. Meanwhile, she's up in her office writing letters stating that the movement of the present day to place women in the same profession as men was mad and utterly demoralizing. She stated a woman's place was in the home and also condemned the idea of a woman becoming doctors or any career. In a letter written by Victoria to her uncle Leopold, king of the Belgians, she wrote that her husband Albert grows daily fonder of politics and business and is wonderfully fit for both, and I grow daily to dislike them both more and more. We women are not made for governing, and if we are good women, we must dislike these masculine occupations. Y'all, the Queen wrote that. In 1850, the Queen was faced with the Women's Franchise Bill passing in Parliament and began a very lengthy correspondence with Prime Minister William Gladstone, letting him know about her strong aversion to these so-called erroneous rights of women, and that she felt so strongly upon this dangerous, unchristian, and natural cry and movement of women's rights that she is most anxious that Mr. Gladstone and others should take some steps to check this alarming danger. Let woman be what God intended, a helpmate for man, but with totally different duties and vocations. Yeah, it didn't age well. And if you're doubting me, let's take a look at this petty beef. Queen Victoria was not for the girlies. She was a bitter and jealous B word a lot of the time and over many different things. One was Lady Flora Hastings, lady in waiting, but also very close friend to Victoria's mother, who in 1839 presented herself to the Queen's doctor with abdominal pain and a severe gut swelling. Lady Flora had been part of the royal household during Victoria's upbringing when the young heir to the throne was subjected to a strict system of rules and regulations that left her isolated and unhappy. The queen still harbored that grudge against Flora because of her association with this bleak time and also her mother, who Victoria had serious mommy issues for. Anyways, Flora was unmarried, so the immediate visual symptoms led to an assumption she was preggers, out of wedlock. Demon ass Victoria rebels in this opportunity and she has former governess Baroness Lezen obligingly spread the rumor that Flora is pregnant. Since Victoria suspected the father was a much hated guardian from her childhood, Sir John Conray, she threw that into boot. Hastings is publicly humiliated, forced to protest her innocence, and undergo a gynecological examination, which proved in fact she was not pregnant. Her swollen stomach was due to advanced liver cancer and she died a couple weeks after. Conroy and others spearheaded a press campaign to slam the queen and her fellow conspirators for smearing and defaming the Lady Flora. It dented the young queen's popularity, and at Flora's funeral two months later, the people quite literally dented her carriage when they stoned it. A lot of hypocrisy, especially from a woman of many lovers, one of whom was very obviously John Brown Scandal. The worst day of Queen Victoria's life, the day her husband Albert died. The second worst day of Victoria's life, when her loyal servant John Brown died. John Brown served as the queen's constant companion, and he pledged to be with her always. After the death of Albert, Victoria relied on her devoted manservant from Scotland for everything. Victoria's children referred to him as mama's lover, naturally, due to the fact they slept in adjoining room. Heated gossip naturally made its way around, why Brown's shocking informal manner with the queen 
and his high-handed, rude ways with other royals seemed to suggest his closeness with Victoria, in the words of one contemporary insider, was contrary to etiquette and even decency. Speculation that the two secretly wed came out when the Queen's chaplain claimed on his deathbed that he performed the ceremony. There was also talk of three additional hidden children. Premarital relations between John Brown and Victoria are a possible marriage, it's never been proven. However, when Victoria died, she requested a photo of him be placed in her coffin, along with a lock of his hair, some of his letters, and his mother's wedding ring he had gifted her. When Victoria died, her son Edward had any statuary destroyed or removed that talked of Brown. He also had 300 letters of his mother's burned. The British monarchy has been known to be better than the KGB at covering up its scandals and destroying evidence, and Abdul Karim is a great example. The portrayal of Karim in Western biographies is that of a rogue who manipulated the queen for wealth. Naturally, that's the classic British racism that brought us colonialism. Abdul was only 24 when he arrived in England, but Queen Victoria was smitten by the young man's intelligence, charm, and seriously hardcore work ethic, and admittedly his height. Victoria upped his status by making Abdul her teacher in the language of Urdu. In return, he introduced her to curry, Urdu writing, and even hookah. That's right, they were hot box and castles, guys. The court was meanwhile repulsed. Abdul was Muslim and supposed to be a servant, and yet he was closer to the queen than anyone else in her immediate circle. Four decades his senior, Victoria brought Abdul with her on all her trips and treated him as a close companion. While a romantic relationship is insanely unlikely, the queen was signing her letters as dearest mother to Kareem, the two surely had a special bond. The English courtiers hated him, and Victoria chose to ignore that snobbish and racist behavior by forbidding it. Naturally, it doesn't make it go away, but it means it didn't happen in her presence. In her final wishes, she was quite explicit. Kareem would be one of the principal mourners at her funeral, an honor afforded to the monarch's closest friends and family. Victoria could not control what happened to the Munshi from beyond the grave, but she did everything in her power to mitigate the treatment she presumed that the family would inflict. Queen's fear is justified. Upon her death, Victoria's children worked swiftly to evict her mother's favorite advisor. Edward sent guards to the cottage Karim shared with his wife, seized all the letters from the queen, and burnt them on the spot. They instructed Karim to return to India immediately, without any fanfare or farewell, and Victoria's daughter Beatrice erased all reference to Karim in the queen's journals, an effing commitment given Victoria's decade plus relationship with them. The royal family's eradication of Karim was so thorough, a full 100 years would pass before an eagle eyed journalist noticed a strange clue left in Victoria's summer home on a tour. Her consequential investigation led to the discovery of Victoria's relationship, the worldwide attention of it, the novel, the movie, and the finding of his heirs. Meanwhile, when the queen didn't like you, it was back to the usual political agitation and request denied. In 1822, after a few small time jobs in the Tory governments over the years, Robert Peel became Home Secretary, where he famously established Metropolitan Police Force for London and reformed criminal law to reduce the number of offenses punishable by death and educate prisoners. In 1834, three years before the events of Victoria, Peel became Prime Minister of a minority Tory government, though his government struggled to pass legislation against the majority rival Whig Party and eventually resigned in frustration after just 100 days or so in power. Then in 1839, Peel got the chance to form the Tory government by Queen Victoria, but he asked in return she replace the Whig ladies of her household with Tory equivalents. Said ladies in waiting were her friends and many were married or related to the Whig ministers and MPs, so Peel refused to form government and Whigs returned to power. The Whig government was limping, but Victoria was passionately attached to Prime Minister Lord Melbourne and also refused to dismiss her female friends. It took the royal wedding of Albert and a failed attempt on their lives in the following year to revive the hatred that this gathered her from the public. And speaking of, Miss Victoria gave the progressive Prime Minister's endless hell. While lapping up the flattery of her favorite Prime Minister, Benjamin Disraeli, who famously admitted he laid it on with a trowel, she never hid her intense dislike of William Gladstone. His approach to the PM role was progressive social policies and she absolutely hated it. And his proposed plan for Irish home rule, which she considered a threat to her empire. Any name she could toss, she would. A mischievous firebrand, arrogant, tyrannical, obstinate, half crazy, wild, incomprehensible old fanatic. More than a few observers sensed there was an element of jealousy in her animity towards the people's William. He was always more liked than she was. When Gladstone won the 1880 general election, she announced to the world she would abdicate the throne rather than accept him as prime minister. Then offered two other liberal grandees the job who insisted Gladstone had to take it. Then she tried to force him to weed out the members of cabinet she didn't like. He refused. Her interventions failed to prevent her cabinets from achieving what they were determined to do, but she could wear them down. One of her prime ministers said handling her was like having a whole separate government department to deal with. But she just wasn't 
a pious wife or an eccentric widow. Queen Elizabeth was also a bad mama. Let's get it straight in clean cut, open, honest terms. Victoria did not like children, but she loved the act of making them, especially with Albert. Unfortunately, she was wildly fertile, so you want one of those things. In those days, you got the other thing. She definitely seemed to be one of the women who lacked inherent biological maternal instinct. That's never a flaw, ladies. You aren't broken, just so you know. Because intercourse during pregnancy was believed to harm babies back then, it meant for the better part of a year, she'd be banned from intercourse or even cuddling with Albert. The two things she wanted more than kids. It's honestly quite fair from her position that she resented her children between being deprived of her husband, not wanting children in the first place, and lacking a maternal drive. Victoria, we should remember, didn't also have much of an experience of a family life, and she was raised under isolated conditions. Victoria, in many respects, was an awful mother as a result. She couldn't help but view her nine children as functional extensions of herself, expecting unquestioning obedience, and was bullying them about their failings. When Bertie, the future Edward IV, rebelled against the rigid system his parents devised for him, she called him backwards and lazy. And when Victoria, who had decided Beatrice would be the unmarried companion of her old age and forbade mentions of weddings in her presence, learned her daughter was secretly engaged, she was so angry she refused to speak to her for six months. She only relented when Beatrice agreed to live with her after they were married. This ain't just some fun and games, this is the Baccarat scandal. Queen Victoria's son, the future King Edward IV, was a notorious playboy and hedonist. His passions included eating, banging, and gambling, with the latter landing him in very hot water in 1891. It starts with a game of Baccarat during a party at the country home of a shipping millionaire. One of the players was Sir William Gordon Cumming, another infamous playboy who was once described as possibly the most handsome man in London, but certainly the rudest. Gordon Cumming was alleged to have cheated during the Baccarat game, an accusation he angrily denied. So as toddy British gents, they have a tea and a chat and come up with an agreement that all players would say nothing of this grave offense if Gordon Cumming signed a declaration promising to never play cards again as long as I live. Not a hard ask. You know, he signed it for nothing, much to Gordon Cumming's annoyance, the story did leak and became a high society gossip. And like a toddy British gent, Gordon Cumming decided to sue several of the background players for slander. The trial was a media circus, the future king appearing in the witness box and society ladies watching through their little opera glasses. Gordon Cumming did lose the case, however, the public was largely sympathetic to him and resented Edward for his part in the whole ugly affair. The prince became deeply unpopular for a time was even booed at Ascot the same month. Another child of Elizabeth's caused a media circus that had her mama reeling, it's the scandal coded daughter. Princess Louise seemed to rebel from the moment she came into the world. She was an exceptional learner, talented, intelligent, artistic, big on women's rights movement, and the most beautiful of Victoria's four daughters. Although an artistic career, or in the words of Victoria, any career, was not appropriate for a princess, let alone a woman, the queen allowed Louise to attend art school and later the National Art Training School. Now, on to the nasty. Historians assert that Louise had an affair with her brother's tutor. Some accounts say she fell in love with him in the years of 1866 to 1870, but it's not determined if anything physical occurred or if it was just a real big crush. Hearing of Louise's infatuation for a man 14 years her senior, the queen quickly dismissed him. Louise, after a couple years, had an affair with the tutor, Walter Sterling, and she purportedly gave birth to his child. As soon as Louise gave birth, the queen arranged for the boy's adoption by the royal gynecologist, Frederick Lowcock. There's no documentation to uphold it. Why would they keep that? They're trying to hide it. Louise served as an unofficial secretary for her mother from 1966 to 1871 and worked closely with the queen's assistant, private secretary, Arthur Big. Rumor has it that these two had an affair. Yet the most scandalous rumor about Louise surfaced at the death of the famed sculptor Joseph Edgar Bohm. Tales spread of him dying in her arms as they made love. In 1890, Louise married a dashing John Campbell. They did have an unhappy marriage, no children, and grew apart. At this point, Louise became romantically linked to Edward Lutons, Colonel William Prober, and an unnamed musician master, pissing off her mom all along the way. And because her children weren't causing Victoria enough problems, then came the Cleveland Street Scandal. One of the most sordid scandals connected with the royals unfolded in 1889 when a post officer messenger was investigated on suspicion of theft because he was discovered to be in the possession of 14 shillings he could not have earned doing that job. The troubled youth is pressured to admit he had earned it in a male brothel. Bit of a big info drop seeing as homosexuality was super illegal back then. The son of Albert Edward is named Albert Eddie Victor and was second in line to the throne of England at the time. At 21 years of age, he attended Trinity College where he made friends with Oscar Browning, a man known to favor attractive male undergraduates and was also connected to said male brothel the police just found out about. When the police uncovered then questioned those working in the brothel, apparently some names came out. Eddie, his father, inter 
intervened in the investigation and no evidence against Eddie could be found or proven. That and the Cleveland Street investigation led to some working boys being given suspiciously light sentences. So there's press speculation that the indescribably loathsome scandal was being swept under the carpet to protect some high ranking visitors to the house. One VIP linked with the brothel was Lord Henry Arthur Somerset, the head of the stables. The next year, Eddie became ill with what may have been venereal disease. Doctors in attendance referred to it as fever and rumors spread of Eddie's intimate relations with a chorus girl of the Gaiety Theatre, Lydia Manton, and later chorus girl, Maud Richardson. The royal family reportedly paid off Maud for her silence. Shortly after, Eddie proposed to Mary of Tech, and she accepted to great relief of the royal family. But the wedding never happens. He succumbs to influenza pandemic in 1889-92, and he developed pneumonia and died very shortly after his 28th birthday. Whether or not he was part of the Cleveland Street brothel scandal, we'll never truly know. When it came to women who ruled with an iron fist, here are some that would shock you on how cruel they acted, like Irene of Athens. She ruled between 797 to 802 CE, and the untimely death of her husband caused the throne fell onto her, leaving her solely in charge. And during her regency with her son Constantine, Irene became very influential in government policies. Although she co-ruled with her son for two decades, she knew her son was an unpopular emperor, and the empress was an ambitious woman and wanted full control of the Byzantine Empire. With the help of some political allies, Irene led a conspiracy against her own son, but ultimately though the mother and son reconciled, but then again, it wasn't in the end. In 786, the public turned against Constantine after he decided to divorce his wife and marry his mistress instead, and so Irene took advantage of this and once again conspired against her son. In 797, Irene organized a conspiracy in which supporters gouged up her son's eyes, maiming him severely, and he was imprisoned and probably died shortly afterwards. With him out of the way, Irene proclaimed herself as the sole ruler and Pope Leo III, already seeking to break links with the Byzantine Empire, used Irene's alleged unprecedented status as a female ruler of the Roman Empire to proclaim Charlemagne as Emperor of the Romans on Christmas Day of 800. Under the pretext though that a woman could not rule and so the throne of the Roman Empire was actually vacant, a revolt in 802 overthrew Irene and exiled her. The power hungry woman remained in exile on the island of Lesbos where she had to support herself by spinning wool. She remained on the island of Lesbos until she died a year later and see this is why you don't get power hungry and order an execution on your own son by gouging his eyes out. Even if he didn't have many friends, it's not his fault. I mean Rani of Jansi, also known as Rani of Lakshimbai, sounds like a total baddie, maybe not to her enemies, as she was a major threat to them with her violent rage to defend. But hey, when people are occupied, resistance is justified, and she led the Great Indian Rebellion in 1857 against the British colonizers and their imperial government. Wait, this is so cool. According to historians, she threw herself into battle with the reins in her teeth and a sword in each hand, and she besieged the fort where she massacred every British man, woman, and child. Yes, it was terrible for her and many of the Indian resistance, but when it came to colonizers occupying indigenous land, not gonna lie, what do you expect? Like every rebellion of indigenous people who had to resort to violence to protect themselves from people taking over their land, it kinda makes sense. Han Rani, who had been noted as the Joan of Arc, well, Joan of Indian Arc, for her leadership and brilliant military tactics on attacking the British forces. Even Sir Hugh Rose, commander of the British Navy, used artillery to disarm the rebellion, but still, even took note of her leadership and commandment, and was really astonished by it. She assumed regency in place of her adopted son, and rallied forces with the help of the Tatia Tope. She died violently fighting against the British to her last breath and not gonna lie, my kind of woman. What was that mean from Cowboy Bebop? I love that kind of woman that can kick my ass. Something like that. I mean, aside of a woman with the right intention and protecting her people, Queen Rana Valona was a bit of the opposite. She was more of a tyrant than a ruler who had the intention to liberate her people. I mean, in the reality, the only thing that the people need to be liberated from was from her. She had once ruled Madagascar and had no doubt she was as fierce as she would have done anything for her kingdom when it came to outsiders. And people who came to her land by force. And you guessed it, I'm talking about European colonizers. You see, you see, Queen Rana Valona was the first to rule after her husband, King Radama, after he died. During her reign, she got her uncle executed to protect her power, and some records state that she had ended her own mother's life by subjecting her to extreme hunger. She self-proclaimed herself as ruler as a message by the gods, and when she ruled, she had the people's population go from 5 million to half that number. During the 33 years on her reign on the throne, she isolated the island and seized much of its trade and goodwill will exchange it with the African people to the west. She also, with her critics, she forced them to eat poisoned chicken skin and vomit it back up. If they survived the ingestion and regurgitated, they also proved that they were loyal to her, and if they died, it proved that they were secretly disloyal, and her deaths were warranted. It took the island nation decades to recover what was lost under her rule, and in her reign, had killed and chopped off 
off the heads of French and British missionaries and even boiled Christians of Madagascar alive. She killed her rivals in any way that she could and was just very picky. And considering the population was cut in half, she really did pull a Thanos. And speaking of Thanos, Wu Zetan also tried to do the same, but with her family bloodline. Emperor Wu's rise to power was achieved through cruelty and calculated tactics. A popular conspiracy theory stated that she killed her own baby girl and blamed it on Gao Zong and Empress so that the Empress would be demoted. Even so driven with power that when her eldest son was the crown prince and became the crown prince, began to assert his authority and advocate policies, he suddenly died in 675, and many suspected he was poisoned by his own mother. His next heir and kin kept a low profile, or tried to, but then Empress Wu accused him of plotting of a rebellion and was later on banished, which was going to kick her in the butt later, as eventually a palace coup took place and forced Empress Wu to yield her position, and so the next day, her son Zong Zong was restored to the power, and the Tang Dynasty was formally restored. Still considered the golden era, the Tang Dynasty thrived as a high point in Chinese civilization and a golden age of cosmopolitan culture, and with the trades and the land trades alongside the Silk Road's maritime trades by sea, the Tang was able to acquire and gain many technologies and cultural practices and rare luxury items. And it was all thanks to the decision of getting rid of one power-obsessed empress. When it came to Queen Tamar of Georgia, or also known as Tamar the Great, she reigned from 1184 to 1213, as she is also known as the Saint of the Georgian Orthodox Church, as she had appeared for her work in creating the Golden Age of Georgia. Together with her father, King George III, ruled the land until his death, and she ascended to the throne after defeating the nobles who dared to question the reign of a woman, and Tamar then killed all the clerics who questioned her and also replaced them with obscene lawyers that only aligned with her politically. She then married Russian Prince Yuri, who was an excellent military commander, and helped her expand the Georgian territory, but unfortunately for Prince Yuri, he was not loyal. He was a big, big, big womanizer. <laughs> Anytime he did excursions, he went off to expeditions, and, and the land wasn't the only thing he was expediting. So Tamar found out and she banished him for breaking her trust and her heart. I mean, he did what he was set out to do, but you know, these princes ain't loyal. Elizabeth Bathory was a Hungarian noblewoman and alleged serial killer from the family of Bathory who owned the land in the Kingdom of Hungary. Bathory and four of her servants were accused of tormenting and killing hundreds of young and old women between 1590 and 1610. During her arrest, it is commonly believed that Bathory was caught in the act of torment and she was having dinner at the time. Most of the witnesses testified that they heard the accusations from others, but did not see it themselves. The servants confess under torment, which is not credible in contemporary proceedings. See, the accusations of killings were based on rumors, and several authors have argued that Elizabeth Bathory was a victim of conspiracy. Similarly, during the Salem witch trials, many people insisted that they saw accused witches of flying through the sky, and clearly neither things happened and are possibly formed of mass delusion or self-interest lies. Historians are therefore extremely careful in how they treat the eyewitness account of this sort of given possibility and collective in reinforcing the delusions of Elizabeth of Bathory. And when it came to Laura, Bullion, also known as the Rose of the Wild Bunch, was a female outlaw who ruled the association with the Wild Bunch Gang, a notorious group of American outlaws led by Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid during the late 19th and early 20th century. Loria Bullion was born in Knickerbocker, Texas in 1876, and her family moved to the mining town of Moab, Utah, where she grew up. Laura became acquainted with the members of the Wild Bunch, including Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, and another bunch of notorious outlaws. She developed a romantic relationship with Kid Curry, a member of the gang, and Loria Bullion participated in various criminal activities with the Wild Bunch, including train and bank robberies. She was known for her sharp shooting skills and her involvement with the gang's illegal enterprises, and in 1901, Laura was arrested in St. Louis, Missouri with her involvement with a train robbery. Although she ruled the Wild West with a pistol and a keen eye for targets, she eventually was sentenced to five years in prison, but she only served for three. After her release from prison, Laura Bullion decided to lead a more law-abiding life, where she lived in the assumed name in Memphis, Tennessee, working as a housekeeper. Laura Bullion then passed away in December 2nd, 1961 in Memphis, Tennessee at the age of 85, and her death went largely unnoticed by the public. When it came to Empress of Julia of Agrippina, she was one for the list as one of the most terrible mothers, as unnecessary rulers who ruled under the guise of power by using their child. Yes, Empress Julia Agrippina of Rome regularly tried to overthrow her son. Agrippina the Younger was an ambitious person as far as the Roman rulers go, and she was once the first Roman Empress, although she spent much of her early years trying to dispose her predecessors. She truly believed that she and her son had the birthright claim to the empire, and manipulated her uncle Claudius into changing Roman laws about familial marriage so that the two could wed. Claudius' demise had been surrounded by mystery, and some sources claim Agrippina killed him. Together with her son Nero, she ruled Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Eventually, Nero grew tired of her manipulations and forced her out of power. She attempted to organize political opponents against her son, and he himself had her expelled. Jiang Qing, Lady of China, also known as the Mother of Communism, also known as the Madame Mao, the Chinese Communist Revolutionary and actress and major political figure, was the fourth wife of Mao Zedong. 
Sedong. She ruled as one of the architects and members of the Band of Four at the top of the Communist Party and oversaw the destruction of China's ancient culture, art literature, and agriculture. And although some might see that maybe some of their actions were misled, I'm talking about the villages and tribes spread out throughout China that didn't have a choice in associating with the Communist regime. Mao's government had led to the famine and death of over 500,000 people, although it may be noted even more. And Jiang's was accused of fomenting the widespread civil unrest that had gripped China during the Cultural Revolution, but she refused to confess her guilt. Instead, she denounced the court and the country's leaders, and she received a suspended death sentence, but in 1983, it was commuted to life imprisonment. In the end, though, at the age of 77, she took her own life in the bathroom of a hospital, leaving a note. Queen Isabella of the First of Spain is definitely on this list, as she was problematic like one most of the one-minded sided individuals who have nothing better to do but to be exclusive and ignorant. And yes, I get she was a ruler of Spain that allowed the land to flourish in its riches and benefits, but who was it benefiting? Queen Isabella co-ruled Spain with King Fernandad II from 1451 through 1504. During her reign, she marked by oppression, called Isabella the Catholic, she and her husband instituted the Spanish Inquisition in 1478 to achieve religious unity by punishing non-Christians, doubters, and heretics. In 1492, the notorious Spanish Inquisition began her rule as she instrumented the efforts to expel Spanish Jews and Muslims from the kingdom. In 1492, the same year, she sponsored and led to Columbus' fateful journey as she decreed that all Jewish citizens either convert to Catholicism or be banished from the country. Jews from all around the country were brought to the Spanish court to either pledge their faith to the Catholic Church or be expelled on the spot. As for Columbus, as soon as he discovered the New World and immediately started slaying and enslaving people in Isabella's name, his expeditions to the New World directly led to the eradication of the Arawak people and the ends of millions of other other native peoples around the world. A dark legacy that was following both him and Isabella to this day. I mean, colonizers do be colonizing, and that's still happening today as it was part of history. King Henry VIII was and still is a nasty man. Sure, he was a pinnacle figure in England's policies and politics, but he did single handedly disrupt century old systems just to marry somebody else. And more than once at that. And it wasn't just the fact that he was marrying multiple wives, it's the fact that he wanted to divorce a wife for a new one, and some of these divorces were cut off one. One way compared to the other. In some way, he was greedy, trying to create a nation under his standards by a male heir, but as greedy as one might be, he was also a hoarder. His urge to spend and purchase the best of everything drove England into debt. Reports suggest that he spent most of the kingdom's revenue hosting elaborated Christmas parties, as he was so fond of hosting parties that he renovated the kitchens of Hampton Court Palace. The renovated kitchen spread over 55 rooms with cooks who could prepare special meals. At the time of his death, he owned vast amounts of wealth, and the list of the wealth is as follows. 50 palaces, 6,500 hand weapons, 78 recorders, 70 ships, 78 flutes, a virginal, 5 sets of bagpipes, and 20,000 other items. When Henry inherited the throne, he also became the owner of money worth of 375 million pounds. He also derived money from the dissolution of monasteries by imposing taxes on the people. And Henry being a big spender resulted him dying by debt as well. On his death, even though he was making bank, on the 20th of January, 1547, he had accumulated 50 royal palaces as a mention of the record of the English monarchy and spent the vast sums on those collections, including those musical instruments and tapestries. But not to mention, gambling, as well as the millions he pumped into wars with Scotland and France. When Henry's son Edward VI took the throne, the royal coffers were in a sorry state. Henry was rather paranoid about illnesses and would go to great lengths to avoiding contracting the sweating sickness and the plague, which is something that his older brother did pass away from. He would frequently spend weeks in isolation and steered well clear of anyone he thought might have been the subject to disease, and this included his own wives. When he took his second wife, Anne Boleyn, caught in the sweating sickness in 1528, he stayed away from her until the illness had passed. Henry VIII was also known to self-medicate during his life, and even wrote his own prescription book which detailed on how to treat ulcers and reduce inflammation. Joining a free tour in the British Museum, you can see Henry VIII's prescription book for which he describes his own treatment of ulcers reading, an ointment devised by the King's Majesty made at Westminster and devised a greenwich to make <laughs> to take away inflammations and to cease pain and heal ulcers called grey plaster. Henry's less than complimentary nickname is a reference to the debasing of 
the coinage that took place during his reign. In an effort to raise funds for ongoing wars against Scotland and France, Henry's chancellor, Cardinal Wolsey, decided to add a cheaper metal to coins and thus mint more money at a lower cost. The increasingly thin layer of silver on coins would often wear off where the king's nose appeared, revealing the cheap copper beneath, hinting the name Copper Nose. Music was Henry's greatest passion, and he was not without musical talent. The king was a competent player of various keyboards, string, and wind instruments, and numerous accounts attested to the quality of his own composition. The Henry VIII manuscript contained 33 compositions attributed to the king's the eighth's whatever it's called, and rumors have been long persisted that the traditional English folk song Green Sleeve was written by Henry for Anne Boleyn, but scholars have confidently ruled out this theory as Green Sleeves is based on an Italian style that only arrived in England long after Henry's death. But fun fact, Henry did have perfect pitch. Speaking from the bank, he spent on the people's taxes for meals and he ate a lot. Henry was 6 foot 2 in height and weighed approximately 200 pounds when he became the king. However, as years went by, Henry indulged much more frequently and his weight went up to 320 pounds and his waist measured up to 54 inches. He consumed about 5,000 calories daily and Henry overweight to the extent that his body couldn't bear his weight anymore. A medical device was constructed to get Henry out of bed, and this device was assisted in getting him off his horse during the later years of his life. Henry became so obese as a result of not being able to exercise as much because of a bad jousting accident, which reopened and worsened a previous injury he had incurred earlier in life. At the time of his death, he weighed 400 pounds, and the measurement for his final set of armor uh, showed that his waist expanded up to 58 to 60 inches in the last years of his life. He developed several health complications as a result, and during his last days, he developed ulcers on his legs which were constantly opened and infected. Henry VIII may have also written a theological treatise called Defense of the Seven Sacraments. This was written as a reply to Martin Luther, a criticism of the Catholic Church, and particularly to Lutherans and theology treaties prelude on the Babylonian captivity of the Church, which criticized some or all of the Catholic sacraments and attacked on the papacy. After all, Henry had a lot of beef with the Catholic Church. Henry was excommunicated from the Catholic Church in 1538. Excommunication means refusing to give someone communion and disallowing them from being involved with the Church. King Henry VIII authorized the Great Bible, the first authorized edition of the Bible in English, to be read aloud in church, and it was completed in 1538 and went through revisions between 1540 and 1541. Between 1536 and 1541, Henry VIII disbanded monasteries, as we know, had taxed the crap out of them, other Catholic religious houses and appropriated their income. The monks who surrendered their rewards, while those few who resisted were executed, and Henry's last words were allegedly, monks, 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 as this seems pretty strange as a face value but it makes more sense when you consider the dissolution of the monasteries. Now, I'm not talking about a specific body count when I say this, but which is pretty obvious of his outrageous relationships and the conquest of the male heir, even though throughout his rule he still kept this ruthless behavior as Henry VIII ordered the death of roughly 72,000 of the English people through the capital punishment during his 38 year reign. Many of whom, including those monks earlier, were being members of the clergy or ordinary citizens and nobles who had taken part in uprisings and protests up and down the country. Victims of the king's reign were either executed by him or killed in his name. And the the category of the penalties were placed into three sanctions, heresy, treason, and denial of his royal supremacy as the head of the English church. Of course, this is due to the fact of his other body count, having to remarry multiple times was considered a big no-no as the Vatican as a king could not have a queen if the previous was still living. But in the case instance of Catherine, his first wife, she was considered too old to bear any more kids, which is why he married Anne Boleyn. It was reasonable enough for him to break off from the church and make his own. Of course, the people loyal to the church did not approve of this and had heavy criticisms of the king's decisions as he would constantly marry, behead, and remarry every woman who came along claiming they could birth him a son. Although scholars believe it could be roughly 52,000 to 72,000 people he could have executed during his reign, it still doesn't change the fact that you didn't know how to chill on the idea of Y chromosomes in your genome, or lack of, which is why you couldn't probably bear a son. Still, he was able to have one as Edward was born. But still, it doesn't justify the killings of so many people. Either way, his bloodthirsty rampage, he was able to give England one of the greatest rulers of their time, Queen Elizabeth I. And fine, fine, I'll talk about that body count. Yes, of course, when it came to Henry, we gotta talk about the one specific fact that everybody knows him on, was the fact that he couldn't keep to himself. Henry VIII's womanizing reputation has lasted throughout history thanks to his six infamous wives and mistresses. In spite of this reputation, we only know of three specific mistresses, one of being Anne Boleyn's sister, Mary. 
because divorce wasn't allowed within the Roman Catholic Church, Henry wasn't allowed to divorce Catherine of Aragon and remarry Anne Boleyn. To get around this, Henry broke with the papacy in Rome and established a Church of England instead. There's a common belief that Henry married and discarded his six wives in quick succession, but that's not exactly true. He married his brother's widow, Catherine of Aragon, when he came to throne at 17 because he passed away from sweating uh, illness. He died. <laughs> he married his brother's widow who passed away from a very young age due to the sweating sickness that I mentioned earlier. And so Catherine of Aragon became his wife at the age of 17. Good guy, Henry, as he remained married for nearly 24 years. That is until their marriage annulled in order to get married to Anne Boleyn, as his shortest marriage was to Anne of Cleves, which lasted six months. She's buried in Westminster Abbey, and Henry VIII is said to have referred to um, Anne of Cleves as the Flanders mare, and a mare is a female horse, so I'm pretty sure this was not a compliment. In fact, he really hated her. Henry was laid to rest at St. George Capital in Windsor Castle next to Jane Seymour, Edward's mother, regarded by many as Henry's favorite wife, as Jane was the only one to receive a queen's funeral and birth him a son. Two of his wives were executed, Catherine Howard was executed for adultery, and Anne Boleyn was accused of adultery, incest, and plotting to kill the king. Despite denying these charges, she was still executed. Five men, including the queen's brother, were also executed for treasonous, adulterous, and having intimate relationship with the queen. Queen, and the evidence for all of this wasn't great, so we don't really know what happened that day. If anything, if they were all guilty of the crimes they were accused of, or if they were false charges, or Henry just needed to get rid of them. The groom of stool was a position in the royal household in charge of the cleaning, and you guessed it, yes, it's the king's backside. I know I mentioned this position many times before in this channel, but hey, that's something gross and you gotta know about it. Specifically, King Henry VIII, among many of his reforms, King Henry VIII introduced his job as he plucked one of the sons of the nobles' families to literally wipe his butt. And although this is a very odd and specific job for a male kin to do, there might have been a suspicion it was to teach a relative who he didn't like that I can make your offspring kiss my <laughs> kiss my butt. Or maybe the reason he wanted to do so was because maybe family is the only people you can trust. However, those graced with this position would also be required to watch his diet, document them, and then be ready once those bowel movements cha cha their way down. They didn't have baby wipes or baby powder, but they did have to make sure it was clean and dry. They also had to wipe down his buttocks with a sponge or a wet nurse, or just be a glorified butt washer. They were also responsible for helping him urinate and defecate by providing a wash basin, or for them just to use a regular old pot. And considering how unhygienic the medieval times were, I don't think they had latex gloves to protect themselves. This job was actually considered a very respectable job, as this was a direct intimate access to the king. He would live in the castle and earn a great salary, and this tradition King Henry VIII created would then be an ongoing career for the next 400 years. To be fair, this job is equivalent to many medical positions now, as they do, or at least they should pay them well, but at least that's what we should know when it comes to history. Number 10, Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth Bathory, commonly referred to as the Blood Countess, occupies a pretty creepy place in history as a Hungarian noblewoman with a notorious reputation. She is believed to be one of the most prolific female serial killers in history, earning her eerie nickname from the gruesome practice of bathing in the red red of her victims. This ritual was apparently rooted in her belief that it could preserve her youthfulness, and it sounds like some pretty extreme anti-aging to me. Operating during the late 16th and early 17th centuries within the walls of her castle, now located in modern day Slovakia, Bathory subjected an estimated 650 girls to unimaginable horrors. Her reign of terror reached its thankful end on December 30th, 1610, when Elizabeth, along with four accomplices, faced arrest following an investigation into the disturbing rumors surrounding her actions. Despite the severity of the accusations, though, a lack of concrete evidence prevented the claims from being substantiated. However, the absence of solid proof did not grant her leniency, and she was confined to her castle until her eventual passing. Her evil deeds and the whole blood-soaked castle deal make her a heavyweight in the true crime scene. It's a legitimate horror story with more questions than answers. Would probably make a great horror film, though. And in at number nine today is Ma Barker. Ma Barker, a notorious figure in US criminal history, served as the leader of the feared Barker gang, which her sons were also a part of. Gaining the title of the FBI's public enemy number one, Barker orchestrated a series of robberies, murders, and kidnappings across the American Midwest in the early 1930s. Her life came to a pretty explosive end in 1935 during a prolonged standoff in her Florida hideout, setting a record as the longest standoff in FBI history. J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI's first director, once described her as the most vicious, dangerous, and resourceful criminal brain of the last 
decade. Hoover's description added to Ma Barker's mysterious reputation, solidifying her reputation as one of the most evil women of all time. Number eight, Belle Gunness. Belle Gunness holds the disturbing title of one of America's worst female serial killers. Even before considering her terrifying actions, she was already an imposing and physically intimidating woman standing six feet tall and weighing over 200 pounds. It was alleged that she was responsible for the passing of her husbands, younglings, numerous suitors, boyfriends, and even her own daughters, Myrtle and Lucy. Belle's motive was pretty simple. Read. She gained income by stealing life insurance and assets from her victims. Reports suggest her victim count exceeds 20, with some claiming it could be over 100. Inconsistencies in her postmortem examination, such as the reported height being two inches shorter than Belle's six feet, contributed to her becoming a figure in American criminal folklore, often compared to a female bluebeard, because people will make things up and just run with it sometimes. Number seven, Griselda Blanco. Born in 1943, Griselda Blanco, known by her aliases of La Madrina, or the Black Widow, emerged as a frightening figure in the criminal underworld. Hailing from Colombia, she etched her name in history as one of the most ruthless and feared queen pins ever known. Blanco's notoriety reached its peak as a key player in the notorious Medellin Cartel, a criminal empire synonymous with violence and illicit trade. What sets Blanco apart is her unexpected role as a mentor to none other than Pablo Escobar. However, as fate would have it, their relationship eventually soured, paving the way for a rivalry that would echo through criminal history. Blanco's criminal empire revolved around the transportation of a certain illegal powdery substance from the fields of Colombia to the streets of the United States. This calculated operation, coupled with her alleged involvement in up to 200 people being ushered to the pearly gates, showcased Blanco's audacity and cunning in a male-dominated realm. Her ability to not only navigate but dominate such a perilous environment proved her prowess as a criminal mastermind. Following a stint behind bars, Blanco's life met a chilling end on September 3rd, 2012, when she was wiped out in a hail of lead, leaving a void in the criminal landscape she once ruled. I'm all for girl power, but uh, let's just put that energy somewhere else, shall we? Cool. Number six, Christiana Edmonds. Christiana Edmonds, also known as the chocolate cream killer, was an English woman with a really disturbing hobby. She would purchase chocolates, lace them with strychnine, a powerful and toxic chemical, and then return them to the shop. Unexpecting customers who bought those chocolates would naturally fall ill. In 1871, a tragic incident occurred when a young person passed away after consuming one of the poisoned chocolates. Now following this, Edmonds escalated her campaign by sending parcels of her dangerous chocolates to notable individuals. As the police began linking the fatal and damaging outcomes to the chocolates, Edmonds attempted to deflect suspicion by sending parcels to herself in order to mislead the police. How intelligent. Once she was caught, Edmonds was initially sentenced to death, but her punishment was later changed to life imprisonment due to her mental illness. Number five, Mary the First of England. Born on February 18, 1516, Mary I held the throne as Queen of England and Ireland from July 1553 until her passing. As the only surviving child of the marriage between Henry VIII and his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, Mary I's reign is notable for her brutal persecution of Protestants, earning her infamous moniker, Bloody Mary. Her attempt to forcefully return England to Catholicism resulted in the forced passing of numerous prominent Protestants, contributing to a climate of fear and leading around 800 Protestants to flee the country, unable to return until her passing. During her reign, Bloody Mary implemented the heresy laws, which resulted in the burning of over 300 Protestants accused of heresy. Despite the widespread violence, Mary I was never prosecuted for her actions. However, after her passing on November 17th, 1558, the winds of change swept through England, ushering away from her staunch Catholic policies. The efforts to reestablish Catholicism were ultimately reversed, marking a turning point in the religious landscape of England. Mary I's reign entwined with religious strife and political turmoil remains a complex chapter in history where power, ideology, and the consequences of persecution shape the course of a nation. Number four, Wu Zetian. Between 665 and 690, Wu Zetian controlled China as empress through her husband, and later as empress dowager through her sons. However, in 690, she achieved a historic milestone by becoming 
Empress, marking her as China's first and only official recognized female ruler. Wu Zetian maintained her authoritarian position from 690 until her passing in 705. Now, despite the significant achievements in expanding China's territory and establishing it as a powerful empire, her reign was unfortunately also marked by violence and bloodshed. Wu Zetian's rise to power was marked by a series of manipulative and ruthless tactics. She orchestrated the downfall of her political rivals, resorting to schemes such as false accusations, purges, anything to eliminate potential threats. While her success in building a powerful empire is acknowledged, she has faced enduring criticism for the ruthless tactics employed to do so. Number three, Mary Ann Cotton. Mary Ann Cotton, who lived in the 1800s, left behind a criminal tale that's not all neatly documented. Back then, record keeping wasn't the greatest, so we're left with a bit of a puzzle when it comes to the exact details of her evil actions. But it's estimated that Cotton might have offed around 21 people. Three of them were unlucky husbands, and a whopping 11 were her very own family. She had this not so friendly habit of using arsenic to bring their lives to an end, and then cashing in on their life insurance policies. The party came to a screeching halt however, when she attempted this method on her stepson, Charles Edward Cotton, leading to her capture and the grand finale, a date with the executioner. Now, here's where it gets interesting. They gave her a short rope, instead of the customary long one. This meant that instead of physics causing her neck to snap, she instead suffered a long, slow, agonizing suffocation. Number two, Mary Piercy. Mary Piercy, born in 1866, lived in Kentish Town, North London, with her lover, Charles Creighton. Feeling unsatisfied with life, at the age of 24, Mary sought more, leading her to become romantically involved with a man named Frank Hogg. However, it seems that Frank was also already spoken for, being already married to his pregnant wife, Phoebe. The dark events unfolded on October 24th, 1890, when a policeman discovered the almost severed body of a woman in Crossfield Road, Hampstead, along with a blood-stained pram. Mary's association with the crime drew attention when she displayed hysterical behavior at the mortuary while viewing the body of the deceased woman, later identified as Phoebe Hanelow, Frank Hogg's wife. The next day, the lifeless body of Hogg's daughter was found near Finchley Road, a mile away. This time, the cause was suffocation. As the police became more and more aware of the affair between Frank and Mary, they searched Mary's house and found broken furniture and bloodstains. Mary, seemingly unfazed, played the piano and sang loudly during the search. The police ended up uncovering an ax, two knives, bloodstained clothing, and love letters between the illicit couple. Mary's attempts to explain the stains as a result of taking out mice was met with understandable skepticism. The police gathered evidence from neighbors who had witnessed Mary wheeling a pram away from the house on the evening of October 24th and heard screams from her residence. The disturbing truth emerged during the trial at the Old Bailey in December 1890. Mary's defense claimed insanity, but it proved unsuccessful, resulting in her sentencing to be sent to hell. On December 23rd, 1890, at Newgate Prison, Mary Piercy faced execution by hanging, orchestrated by James Barry, just over a decade after her father, Thomas Wheeler, met a similar fate for a similar crime. I guess it kind of runs in the family. Number one, Delphine LaLaurie. Delphine LaLaurie, who, Delphine LaLaurie was a prominent New Orleans socialite who lived during the early 19th century. She's infamously remembered for her role in one of the city's most gruesome and horrifying scandals. Born Mary Delphine McCarty in 1787, LaLaurie married three times and became a central figure in New Orleans high society. However, her reputation took a pretty dark turn when her mistreatment of people that she kept forcibly endured came to light. Reports of extreme cruelty and sadistic practices circulated, revealing the disturbing treatment of servants within the LaLaurie mansion. In 1834, a fire at the mansion exposed a hidden chamber where individuals were discovered in appalling conditions, subjected to unimaginable horrors. The shocking revelations sparked public outrage, and Delphine LaLaurie fled the city, leaving behind a legacy of cruelty that continues to haunt the historical narrative of New Orleans. Number 10, Dracula. The man, the myth, the legend, Vlad the Impaler. This dude was so down bad, he was the inspiration for Dracula. There's really only one reason why he was so evil, and honestly, it's in his name. Vlad the Impaler liked to impale people, oftentimes alive, as if this was the worst thing thought up by a human being 
ever, he would leave the pikes on display, creating a horror only the eyes of medieval Europe could see. There's gonna be a lot of bad dudes on this list, some really saucy villains, unsavory characters who will make your skin crawl, but only Vlad has been bad enough to get a monster inspired by him, essentially turning his actions into somewhat of a spooky mythology. Dude gives off some serious goth energy. There's a few portraits of him, but if you look at it, he's got this stare in his eyes, like, like he wants to impale me or something. Vlad be nimble, Vlad be quick, just wait till you see his sharpened sticks. Number 9. The guy everyone knows. Look, YouTube won't let me say his name, but do we really have to? I mean, it's Mustache Man. Infamous for his bad art and lame book, he was the fascist leader of Germany. The very same leader who forced the world into World War II. Remember that one? Yeah. He's the very same monster who organized the destruction of Jewish peoples in Europe, and if he had his way, probably the whole world. I wouldn't be surprised if you showed a picture of him to anyone on Earth, any country, rich or poor, and they will most likely know who that was. That's the kind of evil that will get you talked about in classes all over the world, and likely for a long time. Eventually, he got what was coming to him, and the world had peace and prosperity, and there was never ever another bad stinky war ever again. Why is he not number one, you might be asking? Well, that's just because his numbers don't compare to others, which is a very troubling statistic. I'll get to that later. Number eight, busy man. Most people on this list are not going to need any introduction. Genghis Khan is no exception to that. The Mongol warrior king saw his nomadic empire stretch thousands of miles, being one of history's largest empires. If you've been paying attention in history class, and you should have been, don't skip class or Big Ched will put you in the naughty corner. But yes, that's right, I just referred to myself in the third person. Speaking of third person, that's how many people Genghis unalive in his bloody conquests. Oh, did I say three? I actually meant a lot. Did I say a lot? I actually meant a disturbing amount. Some people like to point out that he was accepting of other people's cultures and beliefs. Yes, that is true, but that's after he burned down the village right before he got to yours, and you got forcibly assimilated into his numbers. As you can also imagine, a bloodthirsty barbarian like him did not treat women with much respect. It's Kangas Khan, man. That's, that's just how it do be. Number seven, so long, Bowser. Ivan the Terrible. Okay, sure, Vlad was called the Impaler, but you can kind of take that a different way, right? Not in that way. All innuendos aside, with a name like Ivan the Terrible, it's kind of hard to work around that. Even as a child, Ivan was showing traits of an evil dictator, or supervillain really, as it's said that he would throw animals off of tall roofs in the same way that Mario throws Bowser off of platforms. Becoming the first Tsar of Russia, and probably its worst, he's responsible for many horrors and crimes, but the most infamous being his responsibility for his own son's demise. After a heated argument regarding his unborn grandson, and in a binding fit of rage, Ivan claimed his son's life. Sure, dads get angry when sons don't help mow the lawns or help take out the trash, but that's going a little far. One minute you're having a fight with your dad, and the next minute you're being carried out by Ghani and pallbearers. You know, the dancing guys, the memes, the casket, you know? Yeah, it's a joke. Number six, the mad doctor. I love doctors. Shout out to the people working in the medical field right now. I appreciate you. I couldn't even imagine the horror that is medical school, though. We all know my track record for reading, and hours upon hours of studying would just be bad for my health. I gotta squeeze more video game time in there. It's just how I work, man. However, one doctor I would not want to cross is Dr. Henry Howard Holmes. He is most likely the inspiration for a lot of horror movies. A serial unaliver said to have been performing surgeries on animals at a young age. Which, again, doing some freaky deaky stuff to animals as a kid is like the red flag of red flags. It's like the only red flag. If that wasn't enough, he used to steal cadavers from the university he was studying at and, and doing all kinds of not nice things to them, not naughty, bad. Having a clear obsession with medical practices and anatomy probably was helpful in disposing of his victims. And like something from Tales of the Crypt Keeper, that's exactly what he did. He constructed a large house, or building really, with trap doors, secret tunnels, and a lot of rooms. A basement where he could dispose of his victims. He would later then open this house of horrors up as a hotel where unknowing people would come to meet their doom. Yes, it's Tales of the Crypt Keeper! <laughs> Come check in to the Hotel of Doom! Number 5. 
bad comrade. Stosif Jalin was the leader of the Soviet Union for probably too long. A man who worked his way up the political chain until general secretary meant leader, which if you look it up, it's kind of crazy. That itself is a crazy story. He's responsible for a great loss of life. It is estimated in the range of 40 million people. Ooh, yikes. Most spooky evil dudes usually go after an enemy to someone they consider to not be part of them. He did do this, but a lot of his own people sadly met their ends from the Red Menace too. Organized and deliberate purges of people and famines to starve people. It's safe to say he is and was and always will be one of the worst humans to ever walk the face of the earth. To put it in perspective, Jalen's son was a soldier in World War II, and after being captured by German forces, the Germans thought they had one on the bus. Heck, this was a get out of jail free card, right? Well, when a prisoner trade was proposed by the Germans, Jalen laughed at only how an evil communist could and denied the trade. His son would later perish in a POW camp shortly after. What a monster. You think you trade with me? Ah, keep them, I don't want. Number four, fine white powder. Oh, to be in Miami in the mid 1980s. If I had one wish, it would be to spend a summer night in the neon soaked beaches of Miami under strict laws enforced by a president who didn't know what was going on right underneath his nose. If you were around back then, then you probably got to experience something like that. Or at least in my fever dreams. I hope so. But as much as I'd like to be Tony Montana with all that sugar on his desk, I know it's bad for my health. Speaking of bad for your health, Pablo Escobar. I know, that's where I went with that. Probably the most ruthless criminal ever to live on planet Earth. Pablo was a poor man born in a poor country, but ended up being one of, if not the richest man on planet Earth. His lucrative distribution of adult sugar in the 80s made him very wealthy. It also made him very dangerous, as he was willing to do whatever to get his way. Extortion, bribing, bombing, just about anything you can think of. Oh yeah, he was one bad dude. He had so much money that he had to bury it all all over Colombia. Every once in a while, some of his buried treasure pops up. And as much as I want a quick million in US cash, I'll just put it back where it came from. Oh, Dios mío, lo siento, Pablo. Number three, Al Capone. Another ruthless criminal, and honestly, Capone walked so gangsters like Pablo could run. Part of the ruthless Italian mafia that was the outfit, Capone worked his way through the ranks during 1920s Prohibition America, earning millions in his time where really just $100 could stretch a long way. Capone is noted for his violent behavior throughout his life and the many accidents accidents he caused directly or indirectly. Prohibition and the depression were hard times for a lot of folks in America. However, the media and the people of Chicago at first always wanted to see what the lavish gangster was up to as his criminal life became somewhat publicized. Most likely due to his wealth, the dude was rich. He eventually would get arrested and sent to Alcatraz, which was probably the worst prison in America or the best Call of Duty zombies map depending on how you look at things. I look at things through a Call of Duty way, so eh. Number two, Gavrila Princip. That might not be a name that you're familiar with, but it was the man who unalived Franz Ferdinand, which started World War I, which caused World War II, which caused the Cold War, which caused the collapse of Soviet Russia, and it's why you live in a post-war globalist world with markets developing rapidly in the cyber world. Except maybe the whole thing in Ukraine, watch out for that. Kinda crazy to think how all that could come from one wrong turn and a guy seizing an opportunity. But this also means he's kind of responsible, in a way, for all the bad stuff that happened in those times as well. So maybe don't seize the day? I'm not sure. Just, just don't be ruthless criminals, guys. Watch our videos instead. Although I could blame them for failing my math test in high school. Yeah, we'll go with that. Number one, Mao Zedong. I'd like to come out here and tell you all about the chairman of China, but that simply is just too hot for TV, and if it's too hot for TV, it's too hot for YouTube. Basically, he was the dictator of communist China and is responsible for many lives lost. It's estimated to be somewhere in the range of 60 to 80 million people. Whoa. <laughs> Dude was down bad, the definition of down bad, and although many were told to adore him, there's still a great many people who remember the terrible things he's done. From Beijing to Hong Kong, there's not a person around who doesn't know who he is. If being a no good rotten person was an Olympic sport, he would have gold medals coming out of his ears. Number 10, Julia Tofana. In the 1600s, women who were left under the control of malignant husbands, who would physically end harm and control them, was a rather common issue. And the general rule was that unless 
once her spouse passed away, that was the only time a woman could be granted her freedom. The active contents inside the vial with the artwork of Saint Nicholas were unknown, but mostly it was filled with arsenic, lead, and possibly belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and therefore easy to mix with other many other substances like wine or water. It was called by the name Aqua Tofana, and it was named after the suspected Julia Tofana as she was the main distributor and ringleader of this secret sauce. The actual creator might have actually been another woman who was caught later on. The poisoning of Aqua Tofana would go unnoticed as its symptoms would mimic other illnesses that were prominent at the time. First dosage would mimic a cold, the third dosage digestive issues, and the fourth was death. It was so effective and helpful that when the poison was used in a slow active state, it would give the victims the assumption that they were dying and would write a will and repent. And if the provider of the poison changed their mind, the antidote was simply lemon juice and vinegar. Although the invention of this poison substance was eventually discontinued as so many had been caught with the subject, it lasted for the length that it did due to the assumption that it was a cosmetic, when really it was for women of this time a vial of liberation and freedom. Number 9. Vladimir Demikov A very famous Soviet scientist by the name of Vladimir Demikov was known for his innovation, organ transplants, which had saved many lives in the medical world by extending life from near-death events. However, how he came to this is just as disturbing and concerning as it was revolutionary and innovative, and he would transplant a number of vital organs between dogs. But then he decided to experiment even further by suing together a two-headed dog. He and his assistants would attempt to operate not just a few times, but over 24 times to create a functioning two-headed dog, and it was at the 24th time it was widely publicized. It was even featured on Life magazine and unsurprisingly was considered a very dark, horrifying creation that had been beheld. He sewed together the head of a neck of a small dog named Shavka onto the neck of a large stray German shepherd named Broad Yaga. The mad scientist created an unnatural creation at a disturbing cost. For the surgery itself, Demikov amputated Shavka the lower body below the four legs, keeping her heart and lungs connected until just before the transplant. Then he could attach Shavka to the upper body of a corresponding incision of Brodiaga's neck. The operation lasted three and a half hours, although both could function and here Shavka ended up dying as she was not attached to Brodiaga's stomach, so whatever she ate fell out. And tragically, the two animals died four days later due to the damage of a crucial vein. The previous pair of dogs lasted for a month before they too died in a fatal end, and Vladimir also had no intention to stop his animal cruelty experiments and would continue trying until his death. Number 8, MK Ultra. Project MK Ultra was an illegal human experimentation program designed and undertaken by the CIA and intended to develop procedures and identifying drugs that could be used during interrogations to weaken people and force confessions through brainwashing and psychological torture. MK Ultra used numerous methods to manipulate its subjects' mental state and brain functions such as a covert administration of high doses of psychoactive drugs and other chemicals without the subject's consent, electric shocks, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, isolation, verbal and sexual and other forms of torment. MK Ultra was preceded by Project Artichoke and it was organized through the CIA's office and coordinated with the US Army's biological warfare labs. The program engaged in illegal activities including the use of US and Canadian citizens as unwitting test subjects. Investigative efforts were hampered by CIA director Richard Helms' order that all MK Ultra files be destroyed in 1973. The Church Committee and Rockefeller Commission's investigations relied on the sworn testimony of direct participants and on the small number of documents that survived Helms' order. In 1977, a Freedom of Information Act requested uncovered a cache of 20,000 documents relating to MK Ultra, which led to Senate hearings, but some of the surviving information about MK Ultra was declassified in 2001. Number 7, Philip Zimbardo. An American psychologist and a professor at Stanford University was known for his involvement, leadership, and administration on the research of the Stanford Prison Experiment. He was heavily criticized as the experiment was seen unethical and scientific reasons. The Stanford Prison Experiment was a psychological experiment conducted to stimulate a prison environment to examine the effects of situational variables on participants' reaction and behaviors. Participants were recruited from the local community with an ad in the newspaper offering $15 per day to male students who wanted to participate in a psychological study of prison life. Keep in mind, $15 back then is roughly $114 today. Volunteers were chosen after assessments of psychological stability and then randomly assigned to being prisoners or prison guards. Over the following five days, psychological harm of the prisoners by the guards became increasingly brutal. After psychologist Christina Maslach visited to evaluate the conditions, she was upset to see how study participants were behaving and she confronted Zimbardo and he ended the experiments on the sixth day. The SBE had been referenced and heavily criticized as an example of an unethical ethical psychological experiment as a hardum inflict on the participants in this and the other experiments in the post
post-World War II era. Because of this experiment, it prompted American universities to improve their ethical requirements and institutional review on human experiments to prevent them from being similarly harmed. The goal of Zimbardo's primary reason for the conducting of the experiment was to focus on the power of roles, rules, symbols, group identity, and situational validation of behavior that generally would repulse ordinary individuals. But with one positive result of the study is that it altered the way the US prisons are run. For example, juveniles accused of federal crimes are no longer housed with before trial with adult prisoners due to the risk of violence against them. Number 6. Phalaris and Perilios of Athens Throughout history, humans in general have created an enclave of many extraordinary things. And as civilizations go, for some reason in our distant past, they had an obsession of creating agonizing means and the inflictions of others. Perilios of Athens had created something that at first glance may seem like a work of art, but its uses had been a thing of torment, the brazen bull. The beautiful bronze statue casted in ancient Greece was invented between 570 and 554 BC. The statue was actually commissioned by the reign of Phalaris, an evil tyrant in Sicily. So many would think that he's actually the real inventor or more or less had the idea. This tyrant was also known for eating new babies as his new cruel torment device and the bull was cast hollow and was used as a fire would be built below and its design was that it would be opened and a person would be forced inside. The fire would start underneath the person and it would burn as the smoke and steam would escape from the bull's nose. Incense was placed inside to counteract the smell of burnt flesh and it is said that it was a series of tubes built inside the statue to design to distort the screams of the victim and make them sound like an animal. Phalaris was a piece of work as he wanted to test the sound system of the bull that he even pushed Perlios, the man who created the bull for him, into the belly and lit a fire under him. And then he later released him before he pushed him off a cliff. But by sheer karma, Phalaris died in a bull himself as the city was taken over by Telemachus in 554 BC. Number 5. Lytle S. Adams After hearing about the vicious attacks of Pearl Harbor on the radio, Lytle S. Adams developed a unique plan of vengeance against the Japanese Imperial Army with the Bat Bomb. The bomb consisted a bomb-shaped casting over a thousand compartments, each containing a hibernating Mexican free-tailed bat with a small timed incendiary bomb attached. Dropped from a bomber at dawn, the castings would deploy a parachute in mid-flight and open a release of bats, which would then disperse the eaves and attics in a 20-40 mile radius. Adams stated that the bat was the lowest form of animal life and that until now, reasons for its creations have remained unexplained. He went on to espouse that bats were created by God to wait this hour to play their part in the scheme of free human existence to frustrate any attempt of those who dared desecrate our way of this life. This weird device was then of course proved by President Roosevelt, who's remarked that his friend wasn't crazy, but the idea was worth looking into. Either way, after the conducted of a few tests, the program was eventually cancelled after it was estimated a use of 2 million or in today's value, 32 million dollars was wasted on this invention. When it comes to war, humans showcase the worst of the worst if it means of expanding their nation's political planning. And if you're in the military, there's an internal conflict to fill in your nationalism and your internal duty to serve the country and you forget your economical issues. When it comes to the invention of war, as it has been showcased throughout history time and time again, even in current unfortunate events, the creation leads to genocide by means of invention of different kinds of warfare. Developed by Fritz Harber, who was a professor at the University of Karlsruhe was a brilliant chemist who invented the industrial scale productions of ammonia based fertilizer. Alongside Frederick Guthrie, the two was noted as the ones who weaponized and synthesized a Vescant chemical warfare agent called mustard gas, a widely used weapon used during World War I by both sides of the conflict with particularly harmful and deadly effects. It was responsible for the 1,205,655 non fatal casualties and 91,198 deaths. The effects ranged from minor symptoms such as skin irritation and conjunctivitis. To of severe lung damage when inhaled. Despite the horrific use of mustard gas during World War I, there was a silver lining, the discovery of the first modern chemotherapeutic agent based on observations of World War I survivors exposed to mustard gas. The studies eventually launched an era of cancer chemotherapy research. Number 3. Oliver Winchester An American businessman and politician named Oliver Winchester was best known for his founding manufacturing the marketing of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, aka the Winchester Rifle. The first official Winchester rifle was a model in 1866. Repeating rifles was not widely used until after the war when they became increasingly popular with the civilians. Military authorities concentrated primarily on perfecting breech-loading single-shot rifles for many more years. His ownership was then passed to his son, who died of TB, and his wife Sarah Winchester ended up moving to California with the inheritance as she began to make the famed Winchester House, a haunted mystery house due to her fear of spirits being murdered by the rifle. Number 2. Dow and Company Originally developed to simply enhance the growth of soybeans, Agent Orange was weaponized and used extensively during the Vietnam War. During the war, Dow, Monsanto, and other companies were compelled by the US government to produce Agent Orange under the US Defense Production Act of 1950. Used in large quantities, it was a powerful herbicide used by the United States to deforest the jungles and destroy Viet Cong and North Vietnamese army crops. The United States military sprayed upon up to 20 million 
gallons of herbicides over Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia from 1961 through 1971, covering over 4.5 million acres. Agent Orange was often proven afterwards to cause very serious health problems for both Vietnamese people and returning U.S. military personnel and their families. Among were rashes, birth defects, and severe neurological problems, as well as cancer. This military action has caused the nation of Vietnam since then. The country has reported over 400,000 of their people were maimed and killed by the harm of the herbicides that 500,000 of their children have been born with birth defects caused by the exposure of Agent Orange. The U.S. courts, of course, have constantly ruled that Dow and other manufacturers bear no responsibility for the development and the use of Agent Orange during the Vietnam War and have dismissed all legal claims to the contrary. And finally, number one, Oppenheimer. An American theoretical physicist and director of the Manhattan Project Los Alamos Laboratory during World War II is often called the father of the atomic bomb, causing the destruction and devastation of the Japanese as it resulted the tragedies of 200,000 civilians and military personnel. The ethics of these bombings and the roles in Japan's surrender are subjects of debate. Oppenheimer did important research of the theoretical astronomy as well as the quantum field theory and the extensive of quantum electric dynamics. But with his interest that led him to the development of these weapons still hold to this day dire consequences on the lives that it would affect. In a very famous quote to this recognition, he has said, if the radiance of a thousand suns were to burst at once in the sky, that would be like the splendor of the mighty one. Now I have become death, the shatter of worlds. In a meeting he had with President Truman, he was distraught at the invention as it was now readily usable at the hands of practically anyone. And President Truman was infuriated at Oppenheimer when he said, Mr. President, I feel I have blood on my hands. Responding that he, Truman, bore sole responsibility for the decision on the atomic bomb against the Japanese, which later Truman said, I don't want to see that son of a bee in this office ever again. The Treaty of the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons aimed to reduce the spread of nuclear weapons, but its effectiveness has been questioned. Modernization of weapons continue to this day. Bombs alike have been proved with its massive casualties and results to the devastation, eradication, genocide of innocent people and the tragedy of wars it inhibits in our modern times. Number 10, Lizzie Borden. It might be too clever to talk about Lizzie Borden as a pun, but I'll ask you guys about that later. <laughs> Sorry. Anyways, Lizzie Borden was an American woman who was tried and then later acquitted for the axe murderers of her father and stepmother in Massachusetts. Lizzie was very religious and would go to church and do church activities, teaching Sunday school, etc, etc. Three years later, after her mother passed away, her father remarried to Abby Gray. Lizzie didn't like Abby that much because she suspected Abby's goal was her father's money, and as tensions grew, even more when Andrew would gift real estate to his new family's wife and their stepmother received a house. The night before the murder, their uncle visited their father to discuss property transfer, which placed more tensions. After the crime was committed, the police turned their attention to Lizzie as she gave conflicting testimonies within the day. And after many, many strange occurrences, like her cleaning her dress and burning it up, saying it was covered in paint, the town's suspicion of her drugging her father to sleep in order to whack him with an axe, overall the evidence was unclear and caused many controversial issues. However, the trial was later pushed away when another axe murderer, similar to her father and her stepmom's case, occurred five days prior. Still, the reputation of Lizzie and her sister's involvement was tarnished, and the suspecting evidence and accounts of that day remains unsolved. Number 9, Elsa Koch. Elsa Koch was a German war criminal who committed atrocities while her husband, Karl Otto Koch, was commanded at the Bolchenwald in World War II. Because of the egregiousness of her alleged allegations and her actions, included that she had selected tattooed prisoners for death in order to fashionably create lampshades and other items from their skin. I don't, these are fake, by the way, they're not real. Her 1947 US military commission court trial at Dachau received worldwide media attention, as did the testimony of survivors who ascribed her sadistic and perverse actions acts of violence to Koch giving rise to her image as her concentration camp murderesses. However, authoritative testimony from numerous witnesses at her post-war trials firmly established that she had made extensive use of slave labor at the camp, had assaulted inmates on several occasions, and had reported inmates to the camp SS for beatings. Beatings that resulted in death on at least one occasion while imprisoned, she experienced delusions and had become convinced that the concentration camp survivors would abuse her in the cell. She then ended up taking her own life in jail while serving time. Number 8, Belle Gunness. With an estimated 40 48 deaths at her hand, Bell Gunness poisoned, bludgeoned, and decapitated her victims, all so that she could collect and line her pockets with savings and insurance policies. This lonely hearts killer was known as Lady Bluebeard, amongst other names, luring her victims with newspaper advertisements. Gunness then began meeting wealthy men through a lovelorn column. Her suitors were her next victims, each of whom brought cash to her farm and then disappeared forever, including John Moo, Henry Galthart, Olaf, Oli B, Andrew, just to name a few. One of the victim's brothers came suspicious, and Gunness's luck seems to be running out. Her farmhouse burnt to the ground 
Town and the Smoldering Ruins workmen discovered four skeletons. Three were identified as her foster young. However, the fourth, believed to be Gunnis, was unexpectedly missing as its skull. After the fire, her victims were unearthed from their shallow graves around the farm. All told, the remains of more than 40 men and miners were exhumed. However, Bell managed to skip out of town before being officially convicted and was never tracked down. Her death has never been confirmed. Number seven, Countess Elizabeth Bathory. I don't know if you've seen the tales of Snow White and how there was this once evil queen who yearned for eternal beauty, but like all fairy tales, come from the stem of truth. Countess Elizabeth Bathory was a Hungarian noblewoman who was an alleged serial killer from the family Bathory, who owned a land in the kingdom of Hungary. Bathory and four of her servants were accused of torturing and killing hundreds of young and old women between 1590 and 1610. During her arrest, it is commonly believed that Bathory was caught in the act of the torture, but the reality was that she was just having dinner. Most of the witnesses testified that she had heard the accusation from others but did not actually see it themselves. The servants confessed under torture, which is not credible in contemporary proceedings. The accusations of the murder were based on rumors, and as there is no documents to prove that anyone in the area complained about the Countess, in this time period, if someone was harmed or let's say someone stole something, a letter would be written out as a complaint. Several authors have argued that Elizabeth Bathory was a victim of conspiracy. Similar, during the Salem witch trials, many people insisted that they saw the accused witches of flying through the sky. Clearly, neither thing happened and are possibly a form of mass delusion or self interest lies. Historians are therefore extremely careful in how they treat eyewitness accounts of this sort, given the possibility for collective and self reinforcing delusions. Number six, Dorothea Helen Puente. Dorothea Helen Puente was an American convicted serial killer, and in the 1980s, she ran a boarding house in Sacramento, California, and murdered very various elderly and mentally disabled boarders before cashing their social security checks. She paid each of them monthly spendies, but then kept the remaining for what she claimed were expenses for the boarding house. Puente's boarding house was visited by several parole agents as a result of previous orders for her to stay away from the elderly people and not to handle government checks. Despite these frequent visits, she was never charged with anything. Neighbors began to grow suspicious of Puente when she said that she adopted a homeless man uh, named Chief to serve as a handyman. She had Chief dig the basement and remove soil and garbage from the property, and Chief then put in a newly concrete slab in the basement before he too mysteriously disappeared. In November 1988, another tenant in Puente's house, Alvaro Montoya, disappeared, and after he failed to show up for his meetings, his social worker reported him missing. Police arrived at Puente's boarding house and began to search the property. They discovered recently disturbed soil and were able to uncover seven bodies in the yard. When the investigation began, Puente was not considered a suspect, and as soon as the police let her out of their sight, she basically fled to Los Angeles where she visited a bar and began to talk to an elderly pen. Engineer. The man recognized her from the news and then he called the police and she was charged with nine counts of murder and was sentenced to two years of life. She died at the age of 82 and had always insisted all of her tenants died to natural death. Number five, Julia Tofana. Not your typical Chanel number five, but this too was a femme fatale bottle used by so many women to do one major thing, to get rid of their husbands. By some definitions, Julia was a girl's girl. After all, it was the 1600s, and women who had malignant husbands who would physically harm and control them was a rather common issue, and the general rule was that unless your spouse passed away, that was the only time a woman could be granted her freedom. In its creation was associated by none other than Julia Tofana, who apparently was the ringleader of six poisoners in Rome. In order to avoid detection from authorities, they actually used the Trade name after St. Nicholas and would sell the poison openly as a cosmetic. They even went ahead and used an image of St. Nicholas over the vials, and St. Nicholas and the vial of poison would be sold, affecting over 600 victims, mostly husbands. The active contents inside the vial was unknown, but it was filled with arsenic, lead, and possibly belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and therefore very easy to mix with other substances like wine or water. The poisoning would go unnoticed, and its symptoms would mimic other illnesses that was prominent at the time. First dosage would mimic a cold, the third would be digestive issues, and the fourth was death. It was so effective and helpful that when the poison was used to be in its slow active state, it would give the victims time to assume that they were dying and write a will. And if the provider of the poison changed their mind, an antidote was simply lemon juice and vinegar. Fun fact, Mozart at one point was poisoned using aqua tofana, but apparently he himself started this rumor. And if you knew anything about Mozart, he was the Bugs Bunny level type of troll. Number four, Bonnie Nettles. As cult leaders go, most women of cult leaders were subject to follow their male counterparts. As for Bonnie Nettles, she was the co-founder and co-leader with Marshall Applewhite of the Heaven's Gate New Religion movement. Although she was registered as a nurse and was married to a businessman named Joseph Nettles, she actually lived a relatively normal life. However, according to the New York Times, she began attempting to contact deceased spirits by conducting regular seances and came to believe that the 19th century monk named Brother Francis frequently spoke with her and gave her instructions. She also visited multiple fortune tellers who told her that she would soon meet a mysterious man who was tall with light hair and fair complexion, descriptions that were very close to Marshall Applewhite's appearance. It was unclear how they met, but after Nettles did an astrological 
while reading for Applewhite, they had an instant spiritual connection. Nettles and Applewhite established Heaven's Gate together as equals, with Nettles running the group and Applewhite speaking for her. Nettles claimed to have communicated with aliens about the next level and told Applewhite to tell their followers. When Nettles died from cancer, the mass followers of Heaven's Gates would then follow through by cultivating to take their own lives in 1997. Number 3, Eileen Wernos. On a bit recent note, you may or may not have heard in this case in the news, but Eileen Wernos was a convicted serial killer as she targeted only men as an adult worker. She had up to 7 victims and would target specifically motorists, men who she would meet as a hitchhiker. Her story begins when her mother at the age of 14 married her father at the age of 19. After 2 months of having Eileen, her parents divorced and left her with her alcoholic grandparents who were also malicious in their care. Eileen would then do adult work as a minor once her grandfather kicked her out to live in the woods at the age of 15 and she tried to take her own life multiple times, all failed attempts, and until she met the love of her life Tyra Moore in the late 80s is when she would continue a string of crime. While she was incarcerated at the Florida Department of Corrections BCI death row for women, she tried to appeal to the US Supreme Court, which was later denied, and at that point she dismissed her legal counsel and terminated all pending appeals. She would then go off and say, I killed those men, I robbed them cold as ice, and I'd do it again too, there's no chance in keeping me alive or anything, because I'd kill again. I have hate crawling through my system, I'm so sick of this she's crazy stuff, I've been evaluated so many times. Times, I'm competent, sane, and I'm trying to tell the truth. I'm one who seriously hates human life and would kill again. After extreme mistreatments she suffered while imprisoned and the inhumane management given to her by her officers, in her final interview she turned to the interviewer and said, and also paraphrasing due to censorship, you sabotaged me society and the cops and the system, an attacked woman got executed and was used for books and movies and so on. Her final on camera words were, thanks a lot society for railroading my ass. She was later executed by lethal injection. Number 2, Pearl Fernandez. Again, although this case is one of a very recent event, it still marks as a notable case in the issues that lie in the legal forms, in the protections of minors, and the lack of involvement of CPS. Pearl Fernandez, you may or may not know, was the mother of Gabriel Fernandez, who passed away in Pearl and her boyfriend Usado's custody. According to The Atlantic, Pearl Fernandez and her boyfriend shot Gabriel with a BB gun, tortured him with pepper spray, beat him with a baseball bat, and forced him to eat cat feces. All injuries pointed to severe psychological and emotional distress endured over a long period of time. It was not one time event that led to Gabriel's death, it was months of torture. A judge rejected her remorse, stating that Pearl's actions were horrendous and inhumane and nothing short of evil. At her trial, jurors heard how Gabriel was tortured and abused by his mother and her boyfriend after being placed in their care eight months before his death. Pearl is now serving time at the Central California Women's Facility after being sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Number one, Jolly Jane. While she definitely was jolly when she committed these crimes, Jane Toppin, nicknamed Jolly Jane, was an American serial killer who was known to have committed 12 murders in Massachusetts between 18 and 1901. How did she commit these? Well, she was a nurse, and her objective was oddly enough to target patients and their family members. Doctors who hired her thought of her as one of their best nurses, but today psychiatrists say that she was one of the most unusual serial killers in history. She was born and raised in the Boston Female Asylum, where unwanted female children were often abandoned. There she was adopted by Anne Toppin, where she was under foster care until she was 18. At this point, she then pursued nursing at Cambridge Hospital in Boston. It was here where she stated her interest in the patients was ought to be taken care of. She grew emotional attachments to them, and if she really liked them, she would fake their medical documents to force them to stay longer at the hospital. She would then also dose her elderly patients with opium to see how they react with the drugs, and then upping the dosage each time. She would also watch them slowly succumb to their death, and she would also mix different types of poisons with her patients and other drugs to stage a sickness and nurse them back to health. Very similar to the Gypsy Rose Blanchard case where her mother Dee Dee had a mental illness known as Munch Austin syndrome by proxy, this mental health condition is basically where a caregiver makes up or causes an illness or injury in a person under their care such as the young or the elderly adult, or a person who has a disability. Because vulnerable people are the victims, MSBP is a form of multiple harm cases. Jolly Jane also had a masochistic side, as she would even get into the bed of her patients who were suffering until they died. She wasn't caught until she used a metallic-based poison on a victim, which finally sparked an investigation in a court in 1902. Topan was found guilty, and then she told her attorney that she actually killed more than 100 people, and even got in beds with more of her victims. She was sentenced to stay at an asylum, stayed there until her death. Number 10, Stubbins Firth. Stubbins Firth was a University of Pennsylvania researcher fixated on one particular scientific scheme and a various dangerous one at that. As a trainee doctor, he became obsessed with the idea that yellow fever was non-contagious, to the extent that he went to great extremes trying to prove it. Armed only with a trusty blade and his incessant desire to find the truth, first sliced, opened his arms, and smeared vomit from yellow fever patients into his wounds. When that made no difference, he poured the vomit into his eyes, drank some of it, fried the stuff, and breathed in the fumes. And in a final act of madness, 
madness, he covered himself with blood, urine, and saliva from infected patients. Ultimately, Firth proved this theory so far as he didn't get sick. However, we now know that this was as much down to him making samples from the late stage patients who were past the point of contagion. In other words, Firth swallowed infected vomit but didn't shred much new light on the disease. So he did all that. For nothing. Number nine, Jose Delgado. University of Madrid graduate Jose Delgado may have received a prestigious professorship at Yale University, but his research was on dealing with mind control. While at Yale in the 50s, 60s, Delgado inserted electrode implants into the brains of primates and used a remote control that gave off radio frequencies to make the animals perform complicated movements. Later, he placed the implants into the brain of a bull and got into the ring with the beast using his transmitter to stop charging before it reached him. Aside the animal cruelty, he even tried these experiments on 25 people and wired them up. Behaviorally, it only induced the people's anger and impacted more towards their aggression, but he kept striving for a way to achieve mind control and even once said, we must electronically control the brain and someday armies and generals will be controlled by electric stimulation of the brain. I don't know, I guess it doesn't work. Number 8, Paracelsus. Switzerland Paracelsus' contributions to taxology were based heavily in astrology and he is quite no well known for offering the community a wide array of useful ideas and innovations. He was a pioneer in several aspects of the medical revolutions of the Renaissance, emphasizing the value of observation in combination with received wisdom. However, for all of his use, he also thought he might be able to create a homunculi, or small humans, who stood no more than a foot or so height and performed actions very similar to Gollum. Not Gollum from Lord of the Rings, but pretty close. He is said to have run away after turning on their master. The homunculus creation used bits of people using semen and hair. To him, the fully grown homunculi was supposedly greatly skilled in art and could create giants, dwarves, and other marvels. As though they are art, they are born, and therefore art is embodied and inborn in them. And they needed to learn it from, well, no one. Well, it didn't end up working because they ended up dying uh, right away. Number seven, Peter Nobor. Clinical psychologists led by Peter Nobor ran a secret experiment in which they separated twins and triplets from each other. And a adopted them out as singlets. The experiment, said to have been partly funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, came into light when three identical triplet brothers accidentally found each other in 1980. They had no idea they had siblings, and David Kelman, one of the triplets, felt really angry towards the experiment, quoting, We were robbed of 20 years together, said Kelman in the Orlando Sentinel article. His brother, Edward Gallen, sadly took his own life in 1995 at his home. The child psychiatrist who headed up the study, Peter Nober and Viola Bernard, showed no remorse according to news reports, going as far as saying they thought that they were doing something good for the kids, separating them so that they could develop their own individual personalities. As for what Norbert learned from his evil experiment, that anyone's guess as a result of the controversial study are being stored in an archive at Yale University, and they say they can't actually reveal it until 2066. Number 6, the Burke and Hare. Body snatching was very common in the ages of the pre-19th century, as the only legal way to get bodies for dissection was those of executed criminals. Since it was difficult to get on the waiting list for these bodies, anatomists took burying bodies from the grave, robbers, or even doing it themselves. Up until the students and the anatomists would carry out their own raids in graveyards, requiring cadavers as and what they could. William Hare and his friends William Burke found ways of delivering fresh corpses to their boarding houses without actually having to steal a body, which is that they would smother more than a dozen lodgers at that boarding house. And then they would sell their bodies to the anatomist Robert Knox. And Knox didn't notice or care that the bodies that he received were recently fresh, as it was imperative to his job. Burke was later charged and died for his crimes, and the case spurred the British government to loosen the restrictions on dissection. The scandal led to the Anatomy Act of 1832, where they made a great number of cadavers legally available for education purposes. Typically, these bodies would be from those who died in an asylum and had no relatives or any ways to cover for funeral costs. Number five, Sidney Gottlieb. Gottlieb was in charge of the CIA's MK Ultra project in the 1950s. This project's goal was to investigate techniques that would crush the human psyche to the point that it would admit to anything. I guess in some ways, it's kind of like the truth serum, but with psychology. More specifically, he too also wanted to find a way to do mind control, like Delgado in number nine. He wanted to find ways with the CIA to induce the behaviors of enemies, but in these cases, Sidney went his way to buy dosing unsuspecting subjects with LSD, experimenting with illegal drugs, and sought out all sorts of exciting ways to poison people, including Fidel Castro, as he is the man behind the infamous poison cigar. If you guys know Stranger Things, the suspicion of Eleven getting her powers was from her mom being induced with LSD chemicals that were thought to be creating of powerful abilities, but unlike Stranger Things, it definitely helped open someone's mind up, but not like moving stuff with one's mind. Number four, Sergei Berko Honeko. Although he's been credited 
credited with helping bring about the most important advances with open heart surgery, his gruesome act was that on experimentations on animals, also animal cruelty. Sergei wasn't content with slicing up animals after they died, more specifically not only did he not like to wait, but he also didn't like the animals to die, even after they've been decapitated. In the late 1930s, him and his team undertook a series of experiments as part of which they removed a canine's head and kept it alive away from its body by hooking it up to an air and blood supply apparatus. He would also have another hound had all the blood drawn from its body, only later to be brought back to life by the Soviet Frankenstein. Number 3. Shiro Ishii A microbiologist and a lieutenant general of Unit 731, a biological warfare unit of the Imperial Japanese Army during the Second Sino-Japanese War. Ishii is remembered as the father of biological warfare. Under his watch, thousands of captives were infected with deadly diseases and thousands more were impacted by chemicals on the battlefield. Ishii performed a bunch of experiments that had nothing to do with chemical warfare, including force of actions, vivisections, and simulated strokes. Huh. Humans were also used as a living test cases for grenades and flamethrowers, and prisoners were injected with inoculations of diseases disguised as vaccinations to study their effects. Because life is totally fair, Ishii was never charged with war crimes, and he died peacefully at his home in Japan in the late 60s. Number 2. Joseph Mengele Mengele gained notoriety chiefly for being one of the SS physicians who supervised the selections of arriving transports of prisoners, determining who was to be killed and who was to become a forced laborer, and for performing human experiments on camp inmates, amongst whom Mengele was known as the Angel of Death. Mengele was just a stone cold killer as he performed experiments on 3,000 sets of twins and less than 30 survived his depraved antics. His experiments included but sadly were not limited to dyeing children's eyes to be a specific color since he has an obsession with monochromatic eyes, sewing twins together to make them conjoined, and giving them gangrene. In fact, many of his evil deeds weren't scientific at all. He was just masochistic. He was reportedly smiling every time he took part of his selection process of sending arrivals at camps on who were unfit for labor straight to the gas chambers. He died in 1976 and as he was never brought to justice for his crimes. Number 1. J. Marion Sims Although he was known as the father of modern gynecology, Sims was gained much for his fame for doing experimental surgeries on slave women. Sims remained a controversial figure to this day because the condition he was treating the women, visco genital fistula, caused terrible suffering. Women with fistulas, a tear between their private parts and their bladder, were incontent and were often rejected by society. Sims performed the surgery without anesthesia, in part because anesthesia had only recently been discovered, and in part because Sims believed that operations were not painful enough to justify the trouble, which is what he said, but still regardless, the cruelty he bestowed on these women were not at all consented and manipulated the social institutions on slavery to perform human experiments, which by any standards is unacceptable.